Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the AIOS Scientific Committee Cornea Case Files International Stars. I wish to welcome each one of you who are viewing the Cornea Case Files today, our panelists, our honored speakers, and our international faculty. So I'd like to introduce to you our wonderful international faculty. And the first is Professor James Shadosh, Associate Director, Infectious Disease and Vice Chair of Education, Harvard Medical School, Boston, USA. Dr. Chadosh is a clinician scientist, internationally known and respected for his molecular virology, the viral genomics, viral pathogenesis, in addition to serving as Associate Director of the Cornea Surgery Services, he directs Boston Keratoprosthesis Program and serves the Chair for Ophthalmology Education at Medical School and Associated Chief of Ophthalmology Education at Mass Eye and Ear Institute. His clinical interests include ocular infections, chemical burns, Stephen Johnson syndrome, and keratoprosthesis surgery. Welcome, Professor James Chidosh. I have great honor to also introduce Professor Elmer Tu, Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology, Director of Cornea Services, Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary. Professor Tu specializes in infectious diseases of the cornea, is widely viewed as uh, his expertise in the diagnosis and treatment of acanthamoeba and other severe infections of the cornea. Professor Tu's area of expertise also includes new and innovative forms of cornea transplantation and treatment of challenging ocular surface disorders. I have great pleasure to introduce our own Professor Mahipal Singh Sajdev, President AIOS, Chairman Scientific Committee of IRSI, Chairman and Managing Director of Center for Sight Group of Eye Hospitals. I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Kuresh Muskati of Muskati Eye Clinic, a cornea specialist, past president of All India Ophthalmological Society, Maharashtra Ophthalmological Society, and Bombay Ophthalmologists Association. Dr. Virendra Sangwan is Director Innovations of Dr. Shroff's Charity Eye Center, New Delhi. Thank you, sir, for coming on. Professor Jeevan Singh Tatyal, Professor and Head of Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center, Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. Professor Namrata Sharma, Secretary AIOS and Professor of Ophthalmology, Cataract, Cornea and Refractive Services, Dr. RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. And I request our president, Professor Mahipal Sajdev, sir, to welcome each one of you. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Partha. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, good morning to dear colleagues from uh, US. In the first instance, I'll wish to uh, warmly welcome uh, Professor Shadas and Professor Elmer to this uh, webinar, which is on cornea case uh, reports. Uh, and I would also take this opportunity for the help that was given to us uh, in formulating the guidelines for uh, uh, restarting the practice by AIOS by uh, uh, Professor Shadas. And uh, we did uh, get a lot of information regarding aerosol generation, et cetera, and cataract from him. So I think uh, uh, we have a galaxy of speakers uh, who will be presenting difficult cases or how they manage. And obviously, there will be some areas of gray which we'll be looking at as to whether uh, the correct way was done or there were some other ways and things like that. And uh, I think uh, the panelists are all uh, uh, great uh, cornea people. And uh, having uh, subsectional specialty wise uh, case reports is something that Partha has brought about uh, in this uh, particular webinar, which uh, he hopes to continue uh, going on to further such uh, case series. So I think uh, welcome to all the uh, delegates who are listening, uh, those who have interest in cornea as also otherwise, all the panelists, all the speakers, 
and especially the international faculty and members of the scientific committee who have put this together. I think uh, Dr. Somshila has been significantly instrumental along with Dr. Parikshit uh, and I see Dr. Amit and Dr. Farooz also. So Dr. Sono is also there. Uh, so uh, I think uh, all of you uh, have and Dr. Banda is also there, I think. So I think uh, you have all put this together and let's hope to have a great interaction panel discussion and without much ado, I think uh, Partha over to you or Somshila, whoever uh, uh, would want to start. Thank you. Over to Somshila, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Partha. Thank you, Dr. Maipal. This has been, it's, it's like a dream come true to have these many international and national stars in one meeting all together. And uh, the, of course, everybody knows that the subtopic is corneal infection, which we are battling with. And everybody was very challenged during this COVID times also to handle these infections. So we have a potpourri of very interesting cases and uh, keynotes by, uh, as was already introduced by international star faculty. So we will start off by uh, having the first case presented. Before that, we'd like uh, the first speaker to be introduced. The first speaker is Dr. Rishi Swaroop. Uh, good afternoon. Dr. Rishi Swaroop needs no introduction. So he's a young star himself and he's a medical director and chief surgeon at the Swaroop Eye Center, Hyderabad. He has numerous achievements and awards to his credit. And uh, I think we'll hand it over to him and hear from him. Over to you, Dr. Rishi. Thank you, Dr. Parikshit. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, the AIO Scientific Committee and particularly Dr. Somshila for involving me in this um, first webinar from the Scientific Committee. And um, it's good to be in such august company. Um, I'll just get started with my case. So uh, it's an interesting case, which I had managed a few years ago. And uh, Dr. Somshila wanted me to present a case on this topic. So I selected this one. Just one second. Yeah, is my slides visible? Yes, yes, yes. it's visible. Okay. So this was a 65-year-old uh, female patient who presented to my clinic in November 2011. She was a, a, a case of advanced rheumatoid arthritis uh, who was already on systemic treatment uh, with recurrent episodes of corneal melts in the past. And uh, she had also presented with uh, complaints of uh, uh, history of viral keratitis in the past, which is documented. And um, she had, uh, ha came to my clinic with complaints of blurring and burning of eyes. And uh, she had all the uh, classic systemic uh, features uh, of rheumatoid arthritis, the hand deformities, and uh, both multiple joints of uh, upper and lower limbs, and also had dryness of mouth. Her vision was 6 by 18 in the right eye and 6 by 9 in the left eye. And she had a few SPKs in the right eye um, and a lot of SPKs in the left eye with peripheral thinning. Surprisingly, the vision was better in the eye with more SPKs. Uh, uh, at this point, I don't remember why that disparity was there, but this is what is documented in my file. The Schirmer's was four millimeters in the right eye and one millimeter in the left eye, Schirmer's one, and the rest of the ocular examination was within normal limits. Um, so the patient was put on preservative-free lubricants and um, topical cyclosporin and um, was referred to the rheumatologist to look at her systemic status. And uh, over a couple of weeks, she improved and she, was, she became comfortable and was asked to continue drops. Of course, I gave her the option of punctal uh, occlusion, et cetera. But uh, then the patient came back in December with uh, decreased vision and redness uh, of two days duration. And she had an atypical epithelial lesion, like a heaped up epithelium with the underlying uh, um, stromal infiltration and edema, which kind of looked like a somewhat like a viral keratitis. Her corneal sensations were also reduced. And since she had a past history of viral keratitis, I uh, gave, uh, made a provisional diagnosis of viral keratitis, but the differential diagnosis of a rheumatoid melt. I started on topical antiviral, but also started her on steroids because she had an active uh, stromal infiltrate along with the lubricants, of course, and she responded to this treatment and dissolved within a week. 
Uh, then again, in the subsequent year, March, July, she uh, was, came for a routine follow-up uh, and she was doing okay and her vision also had improved in the left eye. So uh, she was on topical lubricants and cyclosporin. Then in September, the same year, she came with another recurrent dendritic keratitis, which was treated with topical ant antivirals. Um, and then she got okay. At this point, I started her on a prophylactic oral anti uh, acyclovir 400 milligrams twice a day uh, also. And then the patient got back to her old status and she was doing, doing okay. And um, again, one year later, after this was September, and then in August 2013, she presented with another acute episode with uh, drop in vision and she had uh, an inflamed eye with an acute corneal melt. This time it was looking more like a rheumatoid melt. Um, and um, uh, this patient was essentially put on steroids along with lubricants. And of course, I sent her back to a rheumatologist to step up her systemic treatment. And she again stabilized. And uh, for over a year, she was okay. Uh, then in Jan 2015, she came with a drop in vision in her left eye. And uh, her right eye pretty much looked the same, but left eye basically showed an increased cataract. Uh, and the rest of the findings were, were pretty much the same. She had a stable ocular surface. And of course, there was the old scar and thinning from uh, the last episode of MELT and also the previous scars. The topography showed a fairly regular astigmatism, which I'll be showing later. Uh, so since I was planning a cataract surgery for this patient, I decided to go with a toric IOL. This is what the patient's cornea looked like. You can see the scarring and there's a lot of thinning with vascularization, uh, almost 80, 90% thinning, as you can see in these images. And the cataract was about grade two nucleosclerosis. You can see on the OCT that that area was, the stroma was quite thinned out uh, in the area of the scar. And the topo, you can see that there is some irregularity, but there's not much of skewing uh, of the um, Myers. Uh, so uh, uh, the bow tie is pretty much in line. So. I found that these patients often do well with toric IOL. So that's what I decided to do in this particular case. Uh, I'll show you the video, video later when we are discussing. And uh, of course, there were some challenges with visualization, but we managed to uh, surgically, uh, safely implant the toric IOL in the desired axis. I used a technus toric IOL because the, um, that was pretty much correcting what I needed to correct in this particular case. And uh, this is how the patient looked the first post-operative day. You can see that the IOL uh, is in place. And uh, luckily, the vision was pretty good, 6-9, unaided, improving to 6 by 6 parts. And you can see that the IOL is perfectly aligned with the planned axis uh, that was designed, uh, desired. And subsequently, this patient also underwent right eye cataract surgery. The right eye was a better eye uh, in 2017. And even four years later, the patient maintained pretty much the same cornea with a similar uh, visual outcome. So just to show that uh, even in challenging cases, one can uh, use uh, toric rivals and get a good outcome. So there were a lot of points to discuss in this case. One was how does one differentiate a rheumatoid melt versus a viral keratitis? And are these two conditions uh, described in literature to be associated? Um, whether uh, topical and systemic immunosuppression would have predisposed to the viral recurrence? And what, what should one be doing in such cases, um, including the systemic immunosuppression and topical cyclosporin? Uh, cataract surgery in such eyes with bad surface, scars, what um, should one do? Uh, when is it the right time to operate? Should one put temporary plugs before doing surgery? Uh, what is the role of prophylactic acyclovir and how long should one give it in such a case? Um, biometric challenges, etc how to select the toric IOL, et cetera. So I think all these points can be discussed and I'll now hand it over to Dr. Somshila to take it forward. Thank you, Rishi. I think that was an excellent case. Actually deserves a round of applause. You've managed it so well. Thank you. And as you said, there are lots and lots of discussion points. Uh, probably we'll, uh, we'll ask uh, Professor Titiyal and Professor Sachdev uh, to start with your last two points first, actually. So let's start about their experience and I'm sure they had plenty of it. Uh, how do they approach such a case, especially surgery in such scarred corneas? And uh, this was a, a choice for toric IOL, and the patient did extremely well with that lens. And what would their choice be? So how would they approach, and what would their choice of lens be? So either Dr. Titiyal or uh, Dr. Sachiwan. I'm just going to let the surgery video run in the background as we discuss. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so basically, I think uh, I would... Uh, 
beg to differ slightly as regards the choice of uh, a toric intraocular lens. Uh, Rishi has been uh, uh, reasonably lucky that there has been no recurrence of any episode, whether of uh, the rheumatoid melt or the viral keratitis, uh, because both these diseases are known to uh, keep on coming back. So at any particular time, uh, if you are looking to do a toric intraocular lens, if at a particular point you are having what you said was a regular kind of an astigmatism, though if you look at the OCD, there was a gross thinning, and even the slit lamp picture showed a gross thinning, the key point was that it was slightly off-centered. So in case a person gets the recurrent episodes of either of the two things, under those circumstances, instead of doing good to the patient, it could axis of the astigmatism shift in the whole circumstances, you could actually do slight harm. So this is maybe because you are 15, 20 years uh, younger to us. So this, this is a slightly aggressive approach in my opinion, because uh, uh, the basic thing that you want to do in ophthalmology or in any field of medicine is do no harm to the patient. So I would be slightly conservative because A, the IOL power calculation with the, the keratometric readings not being accurate. Uh, I'm sure if you looked at the keratometric readings, uh, they must have been different between uh, a manual keratometer, uh, auto ref K or an IOL master or a topography. So getting to the right power in any case is going to be difficult. You were lucky, but I don't think I would wish to convey this message to the people around uh, that uh, you should go ahead with uh, such a uh, card corneas where there is uh, always a possibility of uh, the disease progressing and uh, having recurrence of viral keratitis with a toric intraocular lens. I would rather leave the patient with a monofocal lens. Obviously, you got a great surgery done. And as was pointed out for you, uh, by you, I would first want to smoothen out the surface. Uh, puncture plugs, definitely, I'll wish to do because the Shermers was pretty bad. Uh, and uh, limited use of uh, topical steroids, maybe not give any NSAIDs uh, in the post-op period and uh, give extensive amount of lubricants to this patient. So that is what I would wish to do. And I would maybe take multiple readings on different instruments to get to the keratometer. And I would prefer to use an optical biometer uh, for doing the uh, axial lens. So I think that's uh, my take on this particular case. If we can just go on to Professor Titial, uh since we have discussed about the surgical aspects, I'd like to actually ask you regarding two points. One is the uh, that the patient had epithelial keratitis with HSV during the course of one of the follow-ups. And Rishi's uh, very valid point was that what is the association between the two? So could you just uh, talk about that part of this case? I think uh, this was a little uh, uh, unusual presentation of uh, two uh, pathologies in a one patient. And I would uh, definitely agree with uh, the diagnosis of you know uh, poor ocular surface because of rheumatoid arthritis, which was very clearly visible in this particular case. And the history of uh, previous viral attacks, recurrent attacks, would also go in favor of that. So both can coexist as a separate entity in this particular case. The patient would have had a case of viral keratitis, recurrent viral keratitis to begin with. And subsequently, patient had uh, the consequences sequelage of uh, rheumatoid arthritis in this patient. So both would be there and they have to be managed uh, separately whenever they uh, recur into a patient's uh, ocular surface. So I think the initial management uh, when it came to uh, Rishi would have been the case with the poor ocular surface because of rheumatoid arthritis. And the management was based on a, the uh, ocular surface finding that is basically a SPKs and a poor uh, a, uh, Shermers in that particular case. I think that initial phase, he, he started him uh, her on a lubricants asset and uh, improving the uh, you know, ocular surface with cyclosporin at that particular stage and patient did well. I think that stage, I would have added the steroid to begin with because patient had a SPK in both eyes and there was no evidence of uh, viral keratitis. And that would have uh, given before uh, actually cyclosporin getting the actual effect of cyclosporin because it will take four to six weeks or six weeks of cyclosporin to you know act. So this surface acting steroid would have given a much better stability for ocular surface and subsequent problem could be handled. So as far as association, I think both can be there. Right. And subsequently patient was lucky that you know didn't have the peripheral melt uh, getting worsened, maybe because of uh, 
better systemic management of this particular case. The lesson to learn in these cases is if you have both things together, so ocular surface staining would be done appropriately. Maybe use uh, rose bengal or lisamine green to say it, if actually it is a dendritic viral onset or is a pseudo dendrite or picture which can happen with these type of cases sometimes and that can mislead you. And if you start antiviral on a surface, that can deteriorate the condition also. So, so that this have to be typical dendrite. This was a typical HSV dendrite. With and if the patient bumps. improved on your treatment, that shows yes. that patient did have a disease. But people who are uh, uh, not into a coronal practice, they have to really do a good staining and see and differentiate pseudo versus the actual dendrite, then initiate the you know, treatment for these patients. And you did a wonderful uh, cataract surgery also. And uh, I think if you want mm -hmm. to give a systemic ACVIL for these patients as a prophylaxis, then you have to give at least sort of six months to one year to have some sort of effectivity. I think, uh, Somshila, there was one uh, query that was there and that was that uh, melt is because of uh, viral keratitis or is it because of the rheumatoid? Did she so, want to just answer that quickly before we move on? The melt yes. is viral keratitis or due to the... So the melt was definitely <laughs> rheumatoid. Rheumatoid. <laughs> So yeah. I think I thought as much because viral yeah. will incite a lot more vessels as compared yeah. to rheumatoid melt, which will be a little avascular, which is being seen in this case. Well, well, Dr. Mahipal was right, you know, the rheumatoid the uh, is a pro progressive disease and your ocular surface and the topography will keep changing for such patients. Even, even viral. More, you know. No, even viral also, you're right. Number so recurrent. So if, he, if the patient has more episodes, then the curvature... You know, may change. Thank you. I think the very valuable points. Uh, thank you, Rishi, for presenting such a wonderful case. I just know that this patient will do well in your hands. And thanks, uh, Dr. Titya, my, Dr. Maipal, Dr. Navrita. So that is setting the stage, actually, for our next speaker. And uh, we welcome Professor James Chodos. Already you've heard the introduction, but for those who joined in late, uh, Dr. Chodos is uh, probably one of the most well-known uh, names in ophthalmology at this point in time, especially and uh, we'll uh, actually we'll, we'll go on to his talk. He's going to talk about HSC for us. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. So uh, thank you. It's a really pleasure to be with all of you. I wish I was with all of you in person instead of on Zoom, but this is the world we live in for the near future. So I was asked to talk about herpes simplex virus keratitis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have no interest, financial or otherwise, uh, relevant to this presentation. This is a case that I thought I'd start with. It's a 20-year-old woman who came in complaining of a red eye and a sore throat. And this is the back of her throat, pictures that we took in clinic. And you can see um, on the right side of her throat these vesiculopustular lesions. This is an image of her uh, ocular surface. And I think your attention will be drawn immediately to the uh, coarse uh, dendritiform lesions uh, in her corneal epithelium, maybe a suggestion of terminal bulbs in a few of these, but I would also uh, bring your attention to these eyelid margin ulcerations. Herpes simplex virus type one or human herpes virus one is an enveloped double-stranded DNA virus. And it's uh, said to be the leading cause of infectious corneal blindness, at least that's what all the grant applications say that are applying for research funding on this disease. There are numerous ways to make the diagnosis, but practically speaking, uh, they're only useful for epithelial keratitis. And for almost all of those cases, the diagnosis can be made clinically. I would note that uh, a common error still, um, at least in the US, is to send for serology. And unless the patient is very young, serology is rarely helpful because infection is so ubiquitous. Herpes simplex virus type one can cause infection of almost any eye tissue. Uh, I've never seen a lenticular infection, but anywhere else you can think of in the eye can be infected by HSV-1. And this is the images of that young woman. Again, for our own interest, we both cultured her and sent for serology. She was 20 years old and the culture was positive for HSV-1 from the eyelid margin and the uh, serology showed a positive immunoglobulin M. And this was a primary infection, which uh, we later uh, came to believe was sexually acquired in this young woman. 
So uh, I want to focus a bit on the classification of this disease because I think we've identified over the years a lot of confusion about HSV keratitis. And I believe that confusion comes about principally because there are so many manifestations and these varied manifestations have very different names and those names vary by region in the world such that it's even difficult in some cases to interpret the literature with regard to the disease. And we've advocated very strongly for an anatomical classification system that any eye care provider who knows how to turn on a soot lamp should be able to do. And that would uh, divide the disease into epithelial keratitis, stromal keratitis without ulceration, meaning epithelium intact, epithelium not intact, and endothelial keratitis. Epithelial keratitis sometimes is punctate, linear, but most commonly dendritic or geographic. Stromal keratitis without ulceration has been called interstitial keratitis, non-necrotizing, or immune stromal. I've always objected to the last term because it implies that other forms of herpes keratitis don't involve the immune system, and that's not correct. Stromal keratitis with ulceration, also known as necrotizing. Necrotizing inflammation is something that pathologists can call, but as uh, clinicians, when we use the term, uh, we like to use that term, but it's not really appropriate. And finally, endothelial keratitis, which at least in the US and I believe in India is often referred to as discoform keratitis. But interestingly, in Japan, the use of the word discoform um, is with stromal keratitis without ulceration. So there's a, one example of which where the terminology uh, because it's anachronistic, is uh, confusing. Um, so really what this requires is that you look at the cornea with the scent lamp and determine where the greatest degree of involvement is. Um, this has been codified in the uh, Academy-sponsored uh, clinical guideline that we published some years ago, which I'll mention again. Uh, this classification system is not novel. In fact, Leopold and Siri proposed a an anatomical system like this back in 1963. And I'm sure if we looked hard, we could find prior uh, examples of this sort of anatomical uh, approach. So what you really need to do to classify it is to pay special attention to the layers of the cornea and also the anterior chamber. And the goal of this is to be able to go from a simple classification to a treatment algorithm. Without that, the treatment algorithms are very confusing. So in this scenario, if you're cloud gazing and you see one that looks different, and in fact, it looks like a falling airplane engine, um, maybe it is. Maybe you should get out of the way in that case. This is epithelial keratitis. And you see here the geographic components in the upper part of your slide, beautiful terminal bulbs at the lower part of your slide. And very commonly, there's a mixed uh, picture. Geographic epithelial keratitis where the basement membrane has been laid bare uh, and dendritic keratitis, um, uh, not so much. This is a slide from Kirk Wilhelmus showing HSV lytic antigens in the corneal epithelium, and epithelial keratitis is literally an infection of the corneal epithelium. The, here it is stained with lysamine green, which beautifully stains both the edges and the stromal base. Fluorescein, which uh, stains better the base. Uh, rose bengal, which stains only the edges. And by this point, you can see the patient is getting dry from all our all our staining. This is not epithelial keratitis. This has been called a ghost or footprint. It's what you see at the last stages as the epithelial keratitis is resolving or has just resolved. It's a subepithelial haze that takes on the shape of the dendrite. And this does not require treatment. These typically resolve on their own. And I'll show you in a moment a case where I, in my younger years, treated one and created a problem for the patient. This is stromal keratitis without ulceration. These literally look like nebulae or clouds in the corneal stroma, and they can occur at any level of the cornea. You can see uh, superiorly deep, full thickness and superficial involvement. Here's another case, um, and they can have, they're very commonly multifocal, and they literally look, do look like clouds floating around in the cornea. They can be denser though when they're more active. And here, I think you can see very nicely how well demarcated they can be by level. They can be only in the posterior cornea with a very sharp demarcation line, almost like the person has had LASIK. They can be midstromal, anterior. There's really no rules about uh, depth location. And it's very common to see them at various depths and various locations. This on the other hand is stromal keratitis with ulceration. And I haven't stained this, 
But um, if you can see my pointer, the, out, uh, the outline of the epithelial defect is here. They're very uh, strong inducers of neovascularization. They very commonly occur or start in the periphery and can, can confuse you in that they are a form of peripheral ulcerative keratitis in, when they present in the periphery. They characteristically march toward the center of the cornea when treatment has not been appropriate. They leave behind a thin, deep, densely vascularized cornea, and they will cross right into the visual axis uh, while you're watching them or perhaps treating them as if they're microbial, not considering a herpetic source. So th these are uh, the ones that are most commonly di uh, misdiagnosed. This was the patient I mentioned who had an epithelial dendrite, had a ghost uh, subepithelial stromal opacity as they were resolving. I thought, mm, maybe I should treat that with steroids. They developed this geographic epithelial keratitis that you can see outlined with Rose Bengal. I quickly withdrew the steroids and induced a rip-roaring stromal keratitis with neovascularization, all of it preventable. Had I just uh, cooled my heels and relaxed, it would have just all resolved. So don't make that mistake. This is endothelial keratitis. And in this situation, the stroma has very few white cells. The inflammation is targeted at the corneal endothelium. And I think you can see these large keratic precipitates with overlying very well demarcated stromal edema with epithelial microboli and microcystic edema. Here's another case. This is HSV strom uh, endothelial keratitis. And you can see what looks like a Kudadus line, but this patient has never had a corneal transplant. Um, the problem with calling this discoform keratitis is that sometimes it's diffuse. And when it involves the whole cornea, it's it's the same process, but it's not discoform. That's difficult to make the diagnosis because you can't see the anterior chamber in that case. Uh, your only clue sometimes is an elevated intraocular pressure, which would be characteristic of a herpetic infection. The reason I asked you to look not only at the layers of the cornea, but also the anterior chamber in all cases is because you might confuse this with a keratouveitis. uveitis. In keratouveitis, uveitis, the inflammation is targeted at the uvea and you get spillover with a bathtub ring of precipitates on the cornea. But the anterior chamber response is the major site of inflammation. So you will have two to three plus cell in the anterior chamber and some keratic precipitates. In HSV endothelial keratitis, there's a paucity of anterior chamber cell. You may see no cells or trace cells, but yet you see these very impressive keratic precipitates. And that's how you make the diagnosis of endothelial keratitis. Uh, as compared to a keratouveitis with uh, endothelial keratic precipitates. Okay, there are some special considerations in HSV keratitis. There's atopy. It's said that HSV is more common in, ato in atopes, more likely bilateral and more likely recurrent and harder to treat. And all of these are based on case series, um, but I believe them based on my personal experience um, if, if you look at the literature, it says that 5% of HSV keratitis is bilateral. In my experience, almost all of the bilateral cases have had uh, the triad of atopy. Uh, this was a, a, a case in point, a patient with bilateral lid margin ulcerations and a coarse epithelial keratitis. Uh, this patient was asthmatic and he presented with his first case of uh, epithelial keratoconjunctivitis and blepharitis. Uh, what about following penetrating keratoplasty? It's almost always epithelial, not always, but usually. And that's because these patients are typically on postoperative corticosteroids, which as we know, can enhance or um, enable epithelial infection by the virus. And it should always be an indication for oral prophylaxis. Personally, I tell patients planning to have surgery with a history of HSV keratitis that they will be on oral antiviral prophylaxis for life. And that's because we don't really have any clinical data suggesting uh, when it's safe to stop. This is a patient, Elmer will uh, recognize this slide. It's from the Baskin Palmer slide set. It's a patient with a corneal transplant on corticosteroids who developed a uh, largely geographic but partly dendritic HSV epithelial keratitis stained here with Rose Bengal. What about quiescent disease? You can have non-healing epithelial defects. Uh, we would characterize them typically as neurotrophic keratitis. They used to be called metaherpetic stromal scars, vessels, lipid keratopathy. And if you don't treat endothelial keratitis promptly and properly, you can have permanent damage to the corneal endothelium and have persistent corneal edema that lasts for the lifetime of the patient unless treated. 
This is a 13 year old who never uh, received proper treatment, came to me with a quite poor vision with extensive lipid keratopathy. I believed at the time this was all avoidable. This is a patient that was sent to me by a corneal specialist who had never received oral acyclovir, had a graft for HSV keratitis and had repeated episodes of stromal keratitis with ulceration that were here marching toward the center. And I'll return to this case toward the end of my talk. We set out um, quite a few years ago to look to see what was the evidence-based foundation for the treatment of HSV. And I'll not bore you with all of this, but uh, what we found was a lesson in clinical trial history in that only the herpetic eye disease study trials, which I'll mention again, uh, used proper methodology in which they calculated sample sizes a priori or prior to starting the trial and were properly powered. So only the head studies could really be looked at as level one evidence. I know you can't read this. These were the epithelial keratitis trials that we found at the time. Um, these were trivial to me and I was shocked to see how many there were because uh, no therapy for HSV keratitis really does much more than shorten the course by a couple of days. And epithelial keratitis, unless the person's immune suppressed or on corticosteroids uh, topically, will resolve without treatment. On the other hand, the stromal keratitis studies were more interesting. Back in 1983 and then in 1992, there were two studies of beta-methasone showing that it was better than placebo when given topically in the setting of topical acyclovir. And then the famous herpetic eye disease study first authored by Wilhelmus that showed that prednisolone given in the context of topical trifluridine, which was the topical agent available in the US at the time, was better than placebo and trifluridine in treating stromal keratitis over a 10 week course. Importantly, and I think the most important findings from all of the head study was the acyclovir prevention trial, which showed that 400 milligrams twice a day, a day of oral acyclovir reduced the rate of recurrent HSV stromal keratitis by about half. So not to zero, by about half, and that will come up in a moment. So these were prospective clinical trials, multi-arm, double mass, multi-center, funded by our NIH. And you could summarize them as saying for stromal keratitis, corticosteroids treat and acyclovir prevents. The studies also showed that adding acyclovir to a topical agent, adding oral acyclovir to a topical agent when already treating with corticosteroid was of no additional benefit. So multiple antivirals don't really help you and that you can't use antivirals to prevent recurrence. Uh, in a patient with epithelial keratitis, adding an oral antiviral doesn't prevent uh, recur uh, recurrent keratitis later. But uh, if you study clinical trials, you'll see that in order to get to a interpretable outcome, you need to have a clear question. And uh, clinical trials, when they have a finding, often lead to new questions which were not answered by the trial. So we learned that topical steroids with a prophylactic antiviral work for stromal keratitis and that oral acyclovir is no additional benefit when treating topically with an antiviral and a corticosteroid. But the question comes, remains, would there be an advantage to use of an oral agent instead of a topical agent for stromal keratitis when treating with corticosteroid? We know that long-term acyclovir reduces the rate, but we don't know who should receive it, and we don't know how long, as was mentioned. We also don't know whether an increased dose or a different oral antiviral agent would be more effective in prophylaxis. No one has ever studied these in a randomized clinical trial. And another question comes up is, would an infrequent uh, low-dose topical corticosteroid further prophylax patients against recurrence? Uh, there's some evidence from surveys that we performed that corneal specialists like to add a, an infrequent or low-potency corticosteroid to their prophylaxis. Uh, but again, that has never been studied. Um, one of my interests has been how to um, diffuse information, for example, from the herpetic eye disease study into clinical practice. All of you on the panel, at least, are corneal specialists, and all of you know that you see patients who come from outside who are referred in, in which the treatment that you would rather provide may not have been given. So how do we deal with that? It turns out that if you study across the board, there's a 17-year lag between the introduction of new information and its full implementation into clinical practice. How do we speed that up? Well, courses like this, but this has limited reach. In the US, we have recertification exams 
but you could get every question on HSV keratitis wrong and get all the macular degeneration questions right and pass this test. We have in the US scope of practice restrictions telling uh, what specific eye care providers can and cannot do, but these are regressive and haven't been shown to actually improve care. In some cases, they restrict bad care, but they don't seem to be improving care. We also have financial means through Medicare started to reward us for evidence-based care, but they quickly became penalty driven. So now we're penalized if we can't show that we have followed evidence-based care. And I, I object to regressive measures personally. Uh, we wrote uh, and published this clinical practice guideline, which uh, very few people look at because uh, it's time to do that. I personally believe that the future is bright because as we develop um, electronic medical records that are actually intelligent and actually learning tools, uh, we can, as you enter clinical findings, for example, the electronic medical record could lead you to a differential diagnosis. And once at that differential diagnosis, the electronic medical records could suggest treatment algorithms that are evidence-based. So the trainee in the future, if they enter, if they're able to do the examination, and obviously we would still need to do an examination, or perhaps we'll have digital photography reading those exams and telling us what to do, and maybe the patient can get their treatment from home. But in the near future, electronic medical records have huge potential to improve evidence-based uh, implementation. And then we're learning a lot in the US from the IRIS Clinical Disease Registry. Over 70% of US ophthalmologists are now contributing data. There are huge numbers of patients whose data is in this registry. And we can learn a lot outside clinical trials uh, with this data. So I'm cautiously optimistic that this 17 year odyssey from new information to implementation will improve. Okay, now to therapy. I like to mention to you that it, it, a lot of what I say is eminence based, meaning it's me sitting on the podium telling you what I do. That's not really evidence. Evidence is uh, using what you can find in the literature uh, it's recognizing the limitations of randomized clinical trials. And I think it's very helpful to differentiate between what's belief and what's been uh, shown in quality studies. I have a bias, and this is evidence-based, for oral antiviral therapy. And my reasoning is that it limits ocular surface toxicity. Uh, you don't have to worry about if the eye is red, whether it's being caused by the oral agent. Uh, these drugs, oral antivirals, are extremely safe long-term. Um, we have three of them in the U.S. that are uh, interchangeable for the most part. Uh, there is this admonition not to use valacyclovir in patients with AIDS. That is a controversial admonition, um, and uh, I follow it for medical legal reasons only. HSV lytic, uh, lytic infection or epithelial infection is a systemic disease. It has to reactivate, and it reactivates in the CNS, and systemic agents get into the CNS. I also have the bias for not the strongest corticosteroid available, but the, what I call the strongest reasonable corticosteroid. For me, that's prednisolone when you need an anti-inflammatory therapy. And I like to, to avoid pseudo failures. Um, if you give a weak corticosteroid and the patient doesn't improve, you still have that potential arm on your treatment algorithm should I have given a stronger corticosteroid. Prednisolone gets into the eye well. You can always change to a weaker drug. I personally avoid diflupredinate in HSV keratitis because we so commonly see intraocular pressure rises. And as you know, those IOP rises can be caused by HSV. And I hate to use drugs that generate confusion rather than clarity. HSV stromal keratitis with ulceration may be an exception to needing a strong corticosteroid. I have many patients that after uh, starting them on an antiviral, and I'll show you that in a moment, I give something like fluoromethylone once a day and their epithelial defect and inflammation clears within several days. It's quite dramatic. So obviously any recommendations I would make are based upon medications available in your region, but it, I've tried to do these based on concepts rather than the specific drug. For epithelial keratitis, it's an antiviral, 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 period. As if it's dendritic, you can use a therapeutic dose. When it's geographic, I worry about long-term neurotrophic keratopathy, and I will usually go right to the maximum therapeutic dosing it, in the US, that might be valacyclovir, 1,000 milligrams three times a day. Uh, I also really like Agancyclovir gel, which we have in the US. 
Uh, we're about to get acyclovir ointment finally, but uh, the gancyclovir gel seems to be extremely well tolerated by patients with very minimal toxicity. Stromal keratitis without ulceration. The treatment is a therapeutic corticosteroid dosing, uh, for example, prednisolone six or eight times a day, along with a prophylactic antiviral. And for me, that's, for example, Valley cyclovir 500 milligrams once a day, or a cyclovir 400 milligrams twice a day. As I've gotten older, I become minimalist in my therapy. I like to give patients medications they don't need to take as often because I've learned that compliance improves as you reduce the frequency uh, with which the patient needs to remember to take their medication. With ulceration, uh, that gets flipped. So here, I believe you need the therapeutic dosing of antiviral with a what I call minimal touch dosing of corticosteroid. There's good evidence that in stromal keratitis with ulceration, there's very deep stromal viral replication. And um, through trial and error, uh, I've arrived at, at this, which has, I think, been backed up by others' experience. In other words, a therapeutic antiviral that might be valacyclovir or gram TID and prednisolone once a day. I usually start the antiviral first, make sure they have it and they're taking it. And then I touch them with a little bit of corticosteroid. And it's remarkable how quickly these highly inflammatory lesions respond uh, when you do this. They don't seem to respond to the antiviral alone uh, fully. They might get a little better, but they don't heal. And then for endothelial keratitis, uh, through, there are a couple of small uh, clinical trials uh, in my own experience, both intentionally and by patient noncompliance, I've learned that you need therapeutic dosing of both the antiviral and the corticosteroid. And these patients can go from hand motion vision to 2020 in 24 hours with a maximal dose of an oral antiviral and a eight times a day dosing of prednisolone. At two weeks, I typically start tapering the corticosteroids. The antivirals can be reduced at two weeks to the prophylactic dose if you've started therapeutic uh, dosing. What about prophylaxis? Well, the head study, as I mentioned, never told us who to use it in, but these are the these are eminence-based indications. I choose to offer prophylaxis patients who've had multiple recurrences of stromal keratitis. If they need to be on corticosteroids, I'd like to reduce that, so I give them prophylaxis. Patients with recurrent inflammation and scar and vessels that are approaching the visual axis, obviously our goal as corneal specialists is to preserve and restore vision in the, you know, due to corneal disease. And so I try to catch it before they need surgery. More than one episode of stromal keratitis with ulceration is an indication for me because these are really the worst players and they almost universally lead to visual loss if not treated. And again, I'm very aggressive about using prophylaxis in patients who are having keratoplasty. And for me, very simply, uh, I like the once a day dosing that I can do with Valley Cyclovir. I increase the dose uh, if they break through. And I also use more in atopic patients because I believe that more is required, but that's eminence-based. There's no hard evidence for that in a clinical trial. So I just wanted to finish up with two cases that I thought you might like. This is a patient I showed before. He was a young man sent to me by a coronal specialist. The coronal specialist told me he had treated the patient with oral acyclovir, but the patient said that he had never taken a medication by mouth ever. Uh, I believe the coronal specialist was just covering his uh, failure. Uh, he had a coronal transplant for herpetic eye disease, uh, was having trouble wearing a contact lens consistently because of recurrent episodes of stromal keratitis with ulceration, and he was 2400. We placed him on oral acyclovir as prophylaxis, uh, stripped the panis, and here he is, went back to 2040 vision with his contact lens and was happy. So it was fairly simple. This is one of my favorite cases. This is a this was a, a dentist who had been on disability for 10 years. He presented to me and said, I don't want surgery. I want to know, can you do anything for me that doesn't involve surgery? I have burnt out herpetic eye disease. And you can see something. There's a finding here, which we don't see very often, but it's a posterior collagenous layer, like we're taught to see in syphilitic keratop keratitis, where you get these sort of cracks in decimase, very characteristic. This is not cornulate. This is not, de these are not decimase folds and you see this opacity at the posterior cornea. And it's a layering of extra basement membrane by a metaplastic corneal endothelium. And you can see the cornea is swollen, he's 2400. And because you can never tell at first visit whether a patient has active disease, really, I place the patient on acyclovir 400 milligrams twice a day and prednisone uh, eight times a day 
as a drop and asked him to return in two weeks. Here he is two weeks later with 2040 uncorrected vision and he went back to work as a dentist. Now he had his depth perception back. So uh, that's really all I have. And I thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Professor Chorosh. I think that was a very, very illuminating talk on the entire spectrum of HSV. And a lot of questions that we had in the chat were, were actually related to treatment as well. So uh, most of the questions have been answered by the panelists. But uh, I think one, I'm not sure if the panelists uh, selected the option of uh, answer to panelists and attendees. We selected so, for everybody. That's the, yeah. No, but I think I have one question and I think lots of other people have asked also the same. Dr. Shadoosh, for how long maximally have you given uh, valcyclovir or acyclovir for prophylaxis? It's an important question and the question, so the answer, the short answer is, uh, I have patients who've been on uh, for their adult lifetimes. Um, I acquired the practice of uh, Debbie Pavin Langston, as who many of you know, uh, had a 50 year practice treating viral keratitis and all of her patients were on, had been on oral prophylaxis, many of them for over a decade. And I chose not to turn that apple cart over. It's, it's very hard replacing Debbie Langston because to her patients, she was a god, and you don't overrule God. Um, I am interested in the work uh, by Verhans from the Netherlands that suggested that in some patients with recurrent epithelial keratitis, they believe that they could show the emergence of a resistant virus. Uh, I had some concerns about the technical methodologies they use to come to those conclusions, and uh, most of my patients on prophylaxis don't have recurrence, so I'll leave that as it is, but these drugs are extremely safe. I do ask and look at the uh, renal function in all, all my uh, older patients on long-term prophylaxis uh, once a year. Most of them in the US are having a chemistry done once a year anyway, and it's available to me in their medical record. And so I pay attention to that. But outside of that, and the, the theoretical concern of resistance, uh, it seems to be very, very well tolerated. So. Uh, you know, it's, I used to tell the residents it's one of the five safest medicines, and then a wise guy resident said, what are the other four? Um, you know, literally, a acyclovir could be given over the counter, uh, and it would meet safety profile for that. Um, so the bottom line is, when the HEAD study completed, when they took patients off the acyclovir, they followed them for an additional six months, and their rate of stromal keratitis went back to what it was for patients who were on the placebo arm. So at least for that length of time, it didn't have an effect beyond when the drug was stopped. The, uh, so uh, one more request to all the uh, participants, the, daily, the attendees, is to post your questions to everyone so that everyone else can also see them. Uh, more, many of uh, the attendees have asked the question about acyclovir and many of the panelists have been replying to them already. But a couple of questions that uh, Dr. Chodosh, I still think that you should answer. And I heard in your talk, you said that in epithelial keratitis, uh, you don't use any treatment or it's not necessary. Is that correct? No, uh, no, I do treat epithelial keratitis because it does shorten the course. Uh, my point was there's been a lot of research looking at drugs for the disorder and it's a common, epithelial keratitis due to HSV is common, but it's rather disappointing when you realize in the studies that the treatment course has only reduced the uh, length of the course of pain and discomfort and poor vision by several days, you know, 20 to 30% at best. So um, in contrast, uh, the blinding diseases have not been as extensively studied. Epithelial keratitis in a normal healthy human being is not a blinding disorder. It typically resolves without sequelae. Although I have seen patients with many, many recurrences who over time start to develop some scarring and perhaps some astigmatism. So for me, epithelial keratitis is a relatively trivial problem that is easy to treat and has a defined outcome, which is recovery of vision. Whereas the other forms of herpes keratitis, if not treated properly, will lead to visual loss um, 
and are, are not recoverable if not treated well. So uh, I couldn't get Dr. Kuresh Maskati's question. Dr. Maskati is asking whether you should do debridement manually. So the evidence, the trials in debridement are old and were not, you know, randomized. Obviously, um, they, they were not. Um, they were not terrific and they showed a very marginal effect. Um, I will share one anecdote from my friend Todd Margolis, who uh, is very knowledgeable and experienced, who says that for epithelial keratitis, uh, when he's sure of the diagnosis, he debrides and places a, an eye patch overnight. Herpes simplex virus doesn't grow well at a body temperature. It grows better in the somewhat cooler ocular surface. So the surface temperature of the coronal epithelium is below uh, is below body temperature. And uh, it's known to herpes virologists in the laboratory that you like to grow them at 34 degrees rather than 37 degrees. So um, he has found, uh, what he says, it works perfectly and the next day the problem's resolved. I have never tried that, um, uh, but that's what Todd has relayed to me. So I, I don't know that debridement, which again can create uh, more discomfort because you've created a larger epithelial defect, uh, if you have personal experience with it, there's, there's no, it's not certainly contraindicated, um, and it's been published. The studies didn't really show a very um, significant effect. So I have one question, uh, Dr. Shadush. Acyclovir has been recently approved in, by the FDA. Not recently, but, you know, uh, with, for us, we had it all along, but uh, you were not using acyclovir. You were using GAN cycle. Were you think there's any difference between the two as far as the so, outcome is concerned? So um, from what I understand from my friends and colleagues, a cyclovir ointment has some tox surface toxicity. Um, the GAN cyclovir gel, I'm only speaking from one-sided personal experience, has very minimal surface toxicity. I can't really tell you that one is better than the other. Uh, unfortunately, GAN cyclovir gel has uh, because of our unregulated pharmacy and uh, uh, absence of competition in the large government programs, pharma uh, pharmaceutical companies charge whatever they want. Again, Psychovir gel in the U.S. has become extraordinarily expensive for those who it's not on the insurance company's list. And uh, in some cases, uh, several hundred dollars for a small tube. So uh, when I have a Psychovir ointment available to me, I'll certainly be trying it. Um, but Oral antivirals in most cases are also very inexpensive. And they, although they're not FDA approved for epithelial keratitis, they appear to work, uh, at least for herpetic eye disease. So, uh, you know, I don't have any uh, particular preference for one over the other. I think uh, in India, you have a vast experience with a psychovir ointment and that's fine. I, I, I wish we had much more time and I wish the whole meeting was on HS3. It could well have been. <laughs> Uh, we're running as usual, time is our enemy. Uh, just one last uh, comment I wanted to say because acyclovir is, is we've been, all of us have been using it and it's not really toxic for the surface. We've, we've been using it for a long time. Uh, I, I think just in the interest of time, a lot of questions have come in, Dr. Chorosh, and especially they wanted to see your treatment slides again, but I know that they are published. So I think that we can send a link to uh, all the participants. In if, if, if you'd like, I will... Uh... PDF that one slide and email it to you, so Michelle, and you can yes, thank you. send Excellent. it as an email to everybody. Like quite a few have asked for that. that okay. Slide. It would be just great. Happy, thank you so much. Happy to do it. So, thank you. I think we just had an amazing talk, and uh, uh, this was really enthralling to listen about HSV. Uh, we'd like to move on to uh, the next speaker. Uh, Paritosh, you could introduce the next speaker for us. Uh, no, no, it's Dr. Manisha. So I'm. So, I'm Tony will introduce the next speaker for us. Dr. So, uh, one second, I think uh, Dr. Kuresh, I can't see, maybe has joined as a uh, audience. So can somebody, uh, Sai or Kripal, call him or somebody to get him on as a panelist? Sure, sir. Yeah. So let me introduce now Dr. Manisha Acharya. Uh, she is a senior consultant, cornea and refractive surgery services. She is the medical director of the Eye Bank at the Dr. Shoff's Charity Eye Hospital, Delhi. And she has to her credit a lot of awards, 
the British Medical Journal South Asia Healthcare Award. She had a travel grant by the European Eye Bank Association, numerous best free paper poster awards. And she has also authored a book on, released by the Eye Bank Association of India on the Eye Bank Recovery Technique. So over to Dr. Manisha Acharya on HSV. Thank you very much. I'll start my uh, screen share. So am I audible and this uh, slides visible? Yes, ma'am. We can see the slides and hear you well. Thank you. A very good morning and very good evening to respective uh, participants and uh, the esteemed faculty. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank the uh, Scientific Committee AIOS for making this possible. And it's a great scientific fiesta, especially Dr. Somshila, for all the efforts you've put in. And it's very difficult to speak after uh, Professor uh, Chodosh, but I will try to present two cases which I have managed in my uh, practice. So HSV, we all know that presents uh, maybe like an epithelial dendrite to potentially blinding, necrotizing stromal keratitis. So we've seen all the, the presentations in the previous uh, uh, presentation. So uh, this 13-year-old child presented with complaints of diminution of vision and pain uh, and redness in left eye for the past three months. The symptoms had subsided with treatment with oral and topical acyclovir. I'll do that. But, I'll do that. Uh, okay. Can you see me now? Following discontinuation. On examination, the right eye was essentially normal, but the left eye had... I wasn't speaking. I said, why, why disturb people with my and, video? Uh, Thank you, Mike, please. Yeah. Never mind. Admin, can you mute Dr. Dr. Muscati? So the corneal involvement actually showed this multiple epithelial bullae in the center. You can see that disc which is forming with the stromal edema. But there was the anterior stromal infiltrate which was measuring around 1 to 2 millimeters and keratic precipitates which were present on the epithelium. So we started this patient on acyclovid five times a day and prednisolone eye drop four times a day with homeotropin and, and a tear substitute for four times a day. A corner scraping was done from that area which was having an infiltrate which was denser. The stream, a smear examination was essentially normal. And, but GIMSA uh, uh, staining showed multinucleated epithelial cells going more in favor of the viral uh, etiology which we were suspecting from the beginning. The RT-PCR for HSV1 and 2 was uh, negative. The reports definitely came a couple of days later. Six days later, with the treatment, the patient had a mild response. So we stepped up the steroids further to six times a day and continued the rest of the treatment. By 10 days, the patient was improving. Uh, and by three weeks, the patient had significantly improved with clearing up of the edema. The acyclovir tablet was then reduced to two times. Prednisolone eye drop uh, was uh, continued in tapering dosage now. And CMC again continued. Six weeks followed, the patient doing much better and was then continued on prophylactic oral acyclovir 400 milligram twice daily uh, and was uh, show, asked to follow up three monthly. The patient did well with this uh, prophylactic dose and was quiescent for six months. But despite being on this prophylactic acyclovir, the patient again presented with this epithelial uh, dendrite. It was started on the uh, topical antivirals and did recover. I'll take you to another patient which is, was, a, was a 46 year old male and had this very classical geographical ulcer. Was started on acyclovir, eye ointment five times, a home atropine, and a CMC eye drop. One week post op, the patient had started to uh, definitely respond with blunting of the edges of the uh, ulcer and uh, was continued on the same treatment. But two weeks later, there was this deep infiltrate which has come up, which was not there previously. And with that, there was this dilemma which came up. Are we dealing with a stromal necrotizing or a stromal keratitis, a combined association or a super added infection? For this, we did scraping, which turned out to be negative for bacteria or fungus. And we stepped up our treatment, start adding oral acyclovir five times a day and uh, along with the topical, which is already on, 
and also added steroids in the form of prednisolone eye drop four times a day. And within a week, the patient started to respond. At that point, we reduced the steroids and tapering dosage and also the oral acyclovir to two times a day. The uh, prednisolone was also put on tapering dosage and a very slow tapering dosage. And later on, the patient was continued on a uh, low dose uh, steroid, which is a load in the form of Lodex, which we get in there. So I would like panel's view in knowing what is the, what is the profile access pro protocol for recurrent cases as the patient, even on the normal dosage, if just a 13 year old boy uh, did recur on oral acyclovir. And also your call on long-term topical steroids or anti-inflammatory therapy in recalcitrant cases. So thank you very much for the opportunity. So I think you wanted me uh, and uh, Dr. Sangwan to comment. I'll jump in. So the first case is interesting. That's a, certainly an unusual presentation. I think you did the right thing by culturing the patient. It almost looked like a Wesley ring uh, on that first presentation. I was wondering about the diagnosis. Uh, I think in retrospect, you got it right. The patient improved dramatically on uh, without, without the presence of any microbial therapy. Uh, the issue in a 13-year-old is clearly uh, the first issue is compliance. The second issue, uh, which can be poor in 13-year-olds, the second issue is uh, that I didn't have time to go into is that herpes uh, keratitis in children and adolescents is really a different beast than in adults. I think that's probably due to the levels of stress hormones that we have in uh, children and adolescents. And it's been my experience that it's much harder to treat. In adults, it's generally a straightforward treatment course once you get to the diagnosis. But in children, it can be very tricky. And they can do exactly as you saw. They present with stromal disease. And then while you're treating them, they develop epithelial disease. And then when you reduce the steroids, their stromal disease worsens. And it's just a challenge. The second case I was looking at and wondering, as you did, could this be something else? I think. Uh, stromal keratitis with ulceration, um, unless you have a really strong history and you know exactly what it is, um, should, you should culture the patient. Um, and in our practice, we, if we're very suspicious of herpetic disease, we may still go ahead and give antimicrobial therapy with an oral antiviral while holding the corticosteroids. Uh, you know, you said it right. Was it a super infection or was it uh, stromal keratitis with ulceration. And I would say uh, it's not clear to me uh, at onset, which it was, I would have held the corticosteroid until I had a negative culture and had given a course of topical antibiotics. Uh, but that reflects my general cautiousness, not necessarily uh, right or wrong. So um, these are hard cases, uh, particularly. Uh, always think about compliance and in young people, as well as atopes, and I probably should add a slide to my talk for uh, HSV keratitis in children and adolescents, because I think they require higher doses of antiviral uh, and very, very close follow-up. Verinder. Um, well, I think, Jim, you covered most of the things. And Manisha, congratulations for managing these two very difficult cases. You know, in adolescent or young uh, kids, the um, HSV keratitis can be very, very atypical. I had a bilateral, almost like an endophthalmitis kind of presentation um, many, many years ago. And when we cultured um, it and on microbiology, it found to be um, HSV. Then we treated with systemic steroid, systemic acyclovir and recovered well. The question about prophylaxis and getting a breakthrough attacks is, you know, as Jim said, only recurrence reduces, but it does not eliminate completely. So therefore, the recurrences or you know breakthrough attacks are likely to happen in some patients. Second, long-term use of low-dose topical steroids. You know, virus gets addicted to these steroids, and they need some uh, dose of topical steroids to keep the inflammation down, keep the virus happy. And uh, in many patients, I would continue very uh, low dose topical steroid on daily or alternate basis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chudosh. Yeah, just one point. Uh, Dr. Chudosh, uh, would you increase the dosage of the uh, prophylactic uh, antivirals? In yes. 
So is that because you feel that uh, it's not adequate? That's the reason why? So if uh, in the head study, a cyclovir was given at 400 milligrams twice a day, and that dose, I believe, was chosen because it's a standard prophylactic dose for vaginal uh, recurrence. That, those are very different diseases. Um, and my personal experience is and practice is that when a patient breaks through prophylaxis, I consider increasing. So instead of, for example, if they're on BID dosing, I might go to TID, or I might go to 800 milligrams twice a day instead of 400 milligrams. Um, and in children, I use higher doses relative to body weight than I might in adults because of this idea I have that it has something to do with stress hormones that are so powerful in uh, children. You know, a child can go, uh, a young child can go from laughing hysterically to throwing a, a temper tantrum. Their, uh, their emotions and uh, stresses clearly are extreme. Um, and I think that has something to do with the problem it also could be that their immune systems are so robust and that some of the manifestations we're seeing are related to a better immune system than, than uh, Dr. Sangwan and I have at our advanced age. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, I don't know. These are all things in my mind, uh, but they may be all false. But yes, I do use higher doses per weight in children. And yes, when I have a patient who breaks through with a visually significant problem, I increase either the frequency or the, the dose. Thank you once again. Uh, Manish, thanks for presenting such excellent cases. It's uh, such an exhaustive collection that you have of these cases and it, all interesting spectra. I limited you to presenting only these two, but everything was very good. and Very nicely presented. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for joining us and taking out this time. Uh, I know it's very early for you, and we really appreciate that. And thanks, Dr. Salman, for your valuable comments, as always. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are lots of unanswered questions, but time is an enemy and it's chop chop. So we're going to move on to the next segment of this, uh, this uh, series. And I request Paritosh to just queue in the next speaker. Uh, it's the doctor, Professor Elma, too. Hello? So Professor Elma, too, is going to uh, give us a talk on acanthamoeba which yep. I actually keyed him in to, to tell us about what, what do we know and, and I've got a very bad bug. So let's see what he has to say about it. Great. So we, we look forward to hearing from Professor Elma. Thank you very much. And thank you for the earlier introduction. I, um, one thing you left out was that I'm the other fellow from Baskin Palmer the year that Jim was a fellow there. So uh, <laughs> yes. that's probably my greatest claim to fame. All right, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here. So today what um, I was asked to do is to go over uh, acanth amoeba keratitis. Now this is certainly something that's probably a little less uh, seen um, uh, among all of the other infections uh, that are very common, including HSV, fungal, bacterial, et cetera, uh, that you all see in common practice. Uh, but it is an important uh, infection and uh, something that often will lead to failure if it's not recognized. And recognition is really the major factor here. Um, if you look at uh, all of the things that are controllable in terms of uh, coming to a good outcome with one of these infections, it's rec really early recognition. Any delay in recognition is the most common controllable factor that will lead to a poor outcome. Once you recognize the possibility of acanthamoeba, you want to go for a specific diagnosis if that facility is available to you and then start prompt aggressive treatment. And the reason for this uh, is that acanthamoeba keratitis is not um, an infection that will be cured in a day or two uh, or even a week uh, that you might see in bacterial keratitis. From clinical presentation, it's a very long and winding road for these patients. Um, in order to get the medications they require, get an, uh, an accurate diagnosis. And then uh, the treatment course is nonlinear. And I always mention this to people who manage these patients is that these patients will do better for a period of time than worse, than better, than worse. It's psychologically wearing really both for uh, the physician uh, and also the patient. So what are we dealing with? Acanthamoeba, as you know, is a free living protozoa. It's found ubiquitously. Uh, it was first identified as an eye pathogen in 1973, but it's found everywhere all around the world. And most of the outbreaks and infections can be traced to water. And we think of recreational water or pond water 
uh, but also household water is a problem. Um, these are older studies, but you can see that as, a, as part of the burden of acanth amoeba, it's relatively low percentage wise uh, in India. But in China, very clearly, you can see that there are places where um, the incidence varies quite a bit based on how many uh, people are wearing contact lenses. And this is also pointed out in a uh, study in Brazil, which showed that as the country became more affluent and people started wearing more contact lenses, that the incidence of acanth amoeba uh, keratitis rose. So it's very important to understand what the risk factors are for uh, acanth amoeba keratitis, which occurs primarily in contact lens wearers in uh, Western countries, but in any country uh, can also be related to trauma uh, and other exposures. Our experience really comes from over 300 cases that we've seen over the last decade and a half or so here at UIC. It's a continuing problem, uh, as you can see here, just from our case uh, counts uh, year by year that really hasn't decreased significantly. So what is it that would clue you in as to the possibility of this being acanth amoeba keratitis? And you can see below, there are a number of different photographs. I think all of us would recognize that the central one uh, would be highly suggestive of acanth amoeba, but the, acanth the patient on the uh, left is also a patient with acanth, acanth amoeba. So when you see patients, uh, we know that risk factors are, are what will initially pique your interest as, the, as the possibility of acanth amoeba keratitis. Contact lens wearers, uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, soft contact lens wearers and rigid lens wearers are really the ones at most risk at about uh, approximately the same risk. As orthokeratology becomes more popular, uh, this has also been a risk that we've seen here in the US. And we have a paper uh, that's currently in press uh, and being in eye and contact lens, which shows that even in the US, orthokeratology is a risk. So that's something that's uh, gaining increasing penetrance in India. It's something you should watch out for in these particular patients. Um, and then as Jim was talking about bilateral disease and atopes, there's actually a fairly high likelihood of a patient having bilateral disease, either presenting at the same sitting or sequentially over time. So the same risk factors that the patient has at home, but probably also um, their own immune systems probably have some exposure to risk that allows both eyes to be affected. Uh, there is no relationship as far as I know with atopy in these particular patients, uh, but we have seen repeated infections in some. So acanth amoeba keratitis initially is not something that is a um, infection that causes a great deal of necrosis. And so what this patient that I showed you earlier, this patient could be easily um, mistaken for dry eye. You can see the epitheliopathy uh, in the picture on the right. One of the keys here is though in these patients that that epitheliopathy usually stops before the limbus. There's usually a one to two millimeter area of clear cornea peripherally which tells you that this is a central corneal problem. And this is a patient uh, who would be, be at higher suspicion for acanth amoeba keratitis. All along the vein of dendritic keratitis, um, nearly two thirds of patients who present to us with acanth amoeba keratitis were previously treated for HSV. And you can see here, this is a patient with uh, acanth amoeba keratitis with what's known as pseudodendritic keratitis. These don't obviously have the form or the terminal bulbs you would expect to see an HSV, but you can clearly see the radial keratoneuritis. That probably developed later and the initial clinician that saw this patient would have easily been fooled into thinking that this was HSV primarily. So if a patient, as Jim was talking about, they don't resolve in a reasonable way, you have to consider the possibility of acanth amoeba keratitis in these patients that appear to be herpetic, but may not be. As I mentioned in the previous slide, radial keratoneuritis is a hallmark, um, a pathognomonic sign that you would see in these patients. It's probably seen in only about a third or less of patients, but if you see a radial keratoneuritis, you want to think about the possibility of acanth amoeba keratitis very strongly. Uh, it has also been described in other infections, including pseudomonas, uh, but the vast majority of these patients are going to have acanth amoeba. And as I mentioned earlier, once they get to a ring infiltrate stage, the diagnosis and the recognition of, the, of the, for this particular disorder is much easier. Uh, the sort of classic Wesley ring with a central area of clearing, or even the deep stromal keratitis you see here on the right, again, a mimic of HSV, but in these particular patients that so they have risk factors, unusual pain, uh, and some are lacking some of the uh, findings of HSV, you want to consider in these patients very strongly that they may have acanth amoeba keratitis.
So it can masquerade as a dry eye, other subacute infections, including fungal infections, microsporidia, herpes, um, and the vast majority are really treated for other diagnoses prior to coming to the attention of somebody who has a diagnostic capability of diagnosing this infection. So it's absolutely critical that the clinician understand the risk factors associated with it so that you can recognize and diagnose these patients early. In addition to um, the, fine, the presentations I showed you earlier, something that may be ap more apropos in your practices is that this is often a polymicrobial infection, meaning that patients with acanth amoeba often present with other infections, including pseudomonas, fungal infections, it's been described with HSV, and also other amoebic infections. So if you have a patient who is not responding appropriately uh, to, the, to therapy that you expect to work, you want to consider in your differential the possibility of a secondary acanth amoeba keratitis that's also present at the same time. And this has really been described throughout the history of its, of its, uh, of its known life of acanth amoeba keratitis ever since the 1980s. And why this is important as far as recognition is concerned that patients do better if you get them at an earlier anatomic stage. As Dr. Chodosh was mentioning earlier, if this is a, something that uh, affects only the epithelium, or the anterior stroma, the likelihood of a good outcome, meaning visual avoiding transplantation, is about 10 times greater than if you diagnose this at, a, at the stage of a ring infiltrate or a deeper keratitis. So it's extremely important in that sense to recognize the possibility early so that you can make the appropriate adjustments to your treatment plan. So uh, in contact lens patients specifically, if, if, uh, if they have any risk factors, just remember that acanth amoeba keratitis needs to be on your differential diagnosis list. As far as diagnosis is concerned, generally you can, in the later stages, you can diagnose these patients uh, with a ring infiltrate sort of by clinical history and examination. But in the earlier stages, you're really going to re be reliant on other studies. And that includes microbiologic methods, uh, non-nutrient agar with enterobacter is probably uh, the most commonly available. Um, media, but even then laboratories have struggle somewhat to identify this microbiologically. You have excellent laboratories here in India, and I know that even with a simple KOH prep, the sensitivity and specificity can be quite high in the 80 to 90 percent range. So I would definitely seek out uh, a microbiologist who is familiar with the diagnosis of acanth amoeba, uh, and I think there is a great deal of expertise in India, probably better than here, uh, that can help you with that. Imaging, if you have it available, confocal microscopy, I think is now proven to be a very useful adjunct, um, but it's very important really to try all avenues of diagnosis because very often you'll only find one of these to be positive, uh, but that will make the difference in your patients uh, in terms of uh, their prognosis. As far as molecular diagnosis, uh, this is becoming better and better each, uh, with each passing month. Uh, as PCR is validated for this, um, it has about equal sensitivity, interestingly, to in vitro and confocal microscopy in most of the current studies, but hopefully as, a, uh, as the tests improve, uh, that will improve as well. So as far as routine medical therapy, this is where a challenge comes in, and that is that much of the routine medical therapy that's used for acanth amoeba keratitis is not something that's easily commercially available. Um, debridement, which was talked about with HSV, is probably helpful to a certain extent, especially in epithelial disease. Um, we usually use a combination of medications, including some sort of diamidine like propamidine or hexamidine, along with a biguanide, and that's either chlorhexidine or PHMB. Uh, unfortunately, the chlorhexidine and PHMB are compounded currently. My understanding from Dr. Dart is that they are um, going to have a commercially available um, PHMB in Europe uh, within the next year or two, now that it's finished its studies. Uh, we'll talk about some systemic medications and the role of steroids as well. So this is what you hope for is a patient with a very early disease. This is a 16-year-old soft contact lens wear with only an, with pretty much only epithelial disease. And you can see very clearly the irregular pattern of the, of the uh, reflected light off of the iris here. Uh, she was positive. We started on chlorhexidine, did a mechanical debridement at the time of her visit. Uh, within 10 days, her vision re returned to 2015. We treated her only for a month in this particular case, and she had no recurrences afterwards. So this is an ideal situation where you identify a patient early, are able to mechanically debride them and treat them uh, for a relatively short time with, a good, with good success. And really, if you look at the results from acanthamoeba keratitis in the past, the visual results have actually been pretty good if you compare them 
uh, to bacterial and fungal keratitis, mainly because there isn't a lot of initial necrosis uh, in these patients. So if you are able to treat them medically, generally they do reasonably well visually. We have found recently, and it's been published out of uh, the Will's Eye Institute, uh, that more recent cases are becoming more resistant to therapy. They're requiring more time uh, in order to resolve their uh, infections. They're getting poorer outcomes and they're needing, needing more drugs. Uh, this is our personal um, observation as well. And in talking to Dr. John, John Dart uh, from Moorfields a couple of years ago, they were also seeing the same problem. So it's unclear whether this is an issue with the medications or if the organism itself is, is changing in some way, but more recent uh, evidence suggests that visual prognosis is less um, uh, favorable than it had previously been. As far as treatment failures are concerned, very briefly, the things that we want to all talk about are extracorneal disease, the possibility of drug resistance, and then also very briefly at the end, surgical management. Um, like all infections, prior corticosteroid treatment of any kind uh, results in a poorer outcome. So uh, the, um, the lesson here is basically if you have a patient who has an unknown keratitis, which is not responding properly to either bacterial or antifungal therapy, that the addition of steroids, if they have acanthamoeba, is going to worsen their prognosis. So if you have a thought that that may be there, you want to definitely uh, pursue specific diagno diagnostic tests to make sure it's not there, uh, but prior corticosteroid therapy is unhelpful in these patients. These patients, interestingly, also have a wide quad quad uh, of extracorneal disease, uh, mainly non-infectious things like dacryoadenitis. adenitis. They can get a non-infectious scleritis. They can also get an infectious scleritis, um, as well as uh, other adnexal disease. So these patients, uh, uh, not only have corneal disease, but they may get a choroiditis, um, and these are often inflammatory and not infectious. So as far as immunosuppression is concerned, John Dart's article uh, back in 2009 really highlighted the importance of using immunosuppression in those patients who are appropriately treated with anti-acanthamoeal drugs. So while prior treatment is bad uh, with steroids, uh, after beginning treatment, it is often necessary in many patients who have either extracorneal or adnexal disease uh, to consider immunosuppression. If you don't immunosuppress these patients, unfortunately, they, get a, they can get a severe scleritis and end up with a tysical eye from ciliary body shutdown. So it's important to walk that fine line once they're on therapy. And then briefly, as far as strategies, these are some of the strategies if, some of, if your standard medications don't work. Um, this includes uh, the use of um, benzoconium chloride containing compounds early on in the process, which can help with epithelial forms of disease. A recent study out of Moorfields showed actually that propamidine, most of the uh, anti acanthamoebal effect comes from the benzoconium chloride rather than the underlying propamidine. Uh, so benzoconium chloride can be uh, a partner, especially in those patients where you don't have access to treatment immediately. Uh, so the use of a, a non-BAK compound or antibiotic would not be preferred in these patients where you suspect acanthamoeba is a possibility. Pentamidine is another diamidine that's in that class, which has been used in the past. Uh, it's extremely toxic and evidence for its um, utility in these patients is somewhat limited. Uh, most of the azoles don't show significant activity against acanthamoeba, and the exception of that is going to be voriconazole. Either oral or topical has been described as an adjunctive or even a primary therapy in a couple of patients that we had uh, for deep-seated acanthamoeba keratitis. And, but I find that this is not consistently effective in most patients, uh, but can be helpful, especially if it's the only thing you have available. The newest class that's interesting is alcohol phosphocholines, primarily miltefacin. Uh, you can see here, I'm not going to go through all of the complications, but it's a common drug used for leishmaniasis around the world. Actually, it's a, probably the drug of choice now. This was the first patient we treated in 2011 on an experimental uh, IND basis. Uh, you see this patient had multiple recurrences after two grafts. Uh, we started the miltefacin, and the patient was able then to clear her infection and actually maintain 2060 vision for quite some time uh, with a clear graft on the bottom right. Uh, I know Bupesh has really pioneered this uh, from a topical treatment. Uh, it does have some effect, obviously causing some inflammation in the eye. Um, we've looked at this in our own patients. Uh, we've had 13 patients, all of which have done well. Uh, we have had a couple of failures as well, but generally 
Uh, this is much more effective. It's probably the most effective oral medication we've had access to. Not 100% effective, but certainly more effective than boriconazole. And then the last thing I want to talk about is surgical management. If you have acanthamoeba that's central and you know the borders, uh, I think a traditional PKP or a DALC uh, in these patients actually does quite well. As you start to get larger, uh, these patients, unfortunately, you start to get into their drainage angles and into their, um, into their iris. Uh, large uh, penetrating care places can work if you can avoid those areas. You can see in the photograph here on the right, this patient did very well just with a large uh, nine, millimeter, nine and a half millimeter PKP. Uh, but if you're suspecting as in many patients with acanthamoeba that there may be extension either to the limbus or into the sclera or into the very peripheral cornea, that can be a significant problem. And in this particular case, uh, recurrence in a transplant usually will take this appearance, this sort of crescenteric advancing area uh, of granularity. Uh, that's usually a, a fairly um, advanced sign of uh, reinfection of a transplant. Uh, in those cases, when you have to go larger, uh, doing a, a standard trephination into the peripheral uh, sclera can cause a significant derangement to the drainage structures in the eye. So our preference has been really to go uh, horizontal. And uh, you can see here in the schematic, um, this is essentially a, an extra capsular cataract wound entering just anterior to the trabecular meshwork and removing uh, both sclera and cornea in these patients, uh, but leaving behind many of the vital structures. So this is a scleral keratoplasty of a different type where we basically replace um, a, a horizontal incision rather than a vertical one. Uh, and I don't know in the interest of time, we can go through this uh, quickly, but basically this is a, um, a dissection uh, all the way around 360, as you can see here. You're going about 80 to 90% depth, and this is taken 360 degrees. And then here, uh, using a crescent blade, uh, an initial entry is made up into the gray line. And then that's taken also 360 degrees around the cornea, so that you're basically left with um, uh, an extra capsular cataract room that goes all the way around, uh, or a scleral tunnel that goes all the way around the cornea. And that's removed in a horizontal fashion. This is actually a case I just did two weeks, three weeks ago. This is all we do during the uh, during the quarantine. <laughs> so yes, we are doing transplant. And you can see here as we remove the last bits of it, and then the corneal scleral button then is attached. And you can trim this to size as you go along, uh, but the final appearance is like this. You can see here, this is the patient that I was just showing. Uh, this is one week uh, after the transplant. Anterior segment is deep, uh, and the iris is relatively normal in this patient with normal pressure. Uh, this patient actually ran into the problem of uh, elevated pressure. You can tell the iris is uh, dilated from chronic acanthamoeba treatment and uh, an infection, this patient actually has a tube shunt, uh, the, the modified um, scleral dissection that I did here. There's a tube shunt in the anterior chamber and this is, a, this is actually the day after surgery. She's actually doing quite well as well. This is a previous patient. These patients nicely, because it is a scleral keratoplasty, care, uh, is that they have very little astigmatism. Uh, and this patient is about five or six years out from her surgery, had one small rejection of her endothelium at one point, but maintains 20-25 vision in the psi, uh, uncorrected after cataract surgery. So thank you very much for allowing me to participate in today's symposium. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to see all of you. Uh, and I hope, uh, hope the, for the best uh, through the pandemic as, as it uh, burns itself out uh, and any other natural disasters that may occur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. That was awesome. There are several questions coming in. Thank you, Elmer. That was absolutely spellbounding to listen to. Uh, one question was uh, about, well, many people have also shared the experience about acanthamoeba keratitis in which the patients had large epithelial defect. 
and stromal haze. This is from Tanuj. And uh, they have diffuse endothelial dusting. So the, the basic, the mood point is that because of the large epithelial defect, these were difficult to heal even with AMG. And then the, the drugs that we use are so toxic. So I think this is a very important question. So how do you manage this? In fact, even I have a patient right now with a PED and anti cancer vapor treatment and secondary glaucoma. So the epithelium just doesn't heal. Yeah, I, the biggest challenge in those cases is to, to, uh, to determine whether that patient is still infected. Um, and that's always difficult. I mean, you have a large epithelial defect. These patients are neurotrophic, uh, significantly so. Um, people have used AMT, um, but using a tarsorophy, and if you still think they're infected, getting medications to the cornea is a challenge. This is where I think relying on uh, oral medications and systemic medications and reducing surface toxicity can be helpful. Cutting back uh, as much as you can on anti-glaucoma medications and also any topical therapy if you can substitute oral therapy for it, uh, I think that that can be very helpful. I've had many patients though, um, the epithelial defect in these patients is not necessarily a sign that there's still infection. Uh, and that's where a repeat confocal microscopy may be helpful or another, or scraping. If you can show that the patient doesn't have persistent infection, you'll have more confidence in reducing the surface toxicity from the medications. And then finally, we had a patient who's had a persistent epithelial defect for some time. We actually stopped all medications months ago. Um, and really the neurotrophic aspect, we started uh, topical neurotrophic growth factor in that patient and they healed actually quite quickly. So uh, that can be a major factor in the epithelial defect and not actually infection or inflammation. So Inshallah, one, one comment from uh, Dr. Maipal Sachdev, uh, because he had gone, I remember if Nikhil can remember that, gone to US and did his fellowship uh, with Dr. Dwight Kavanagh and did study the ConfoScan uh, for the first time and then gave a lecture in RP Center, I remember as a postgraduate student. Yeah, but unfortunately didn't have acanthamoeba at that time. But I remember yeah. when we came back, those were the first cases of acanthamoeba when uh, we were running the cornea clinic that we described in, uh, uh, in RP Center. And I still remember having carried a big bottle of PHMB from US, uh, the swimming pool disinfected and tried to use that. I think Nikhil uh, was there also and maybe Dr. Titial might remember it. So that's about it. I think uh, it's a difficult bug to treat and um, uh, nice to be refreshed with all the latest uh, what is there in Acanthamoeba. I think uh, 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 Professor Elmer has really given a great, great overview. And uh, I think uh, the cases, as has been rightly point out, pointed out, are with contact lens wearers, swimming pool, etc., bad water. And in India, we do keep seeing these cases. So thank you very much. I think uh, it's a great. And now I think you people have worked and others have also been able to see on the confocal microscope uh, the uh, acanthamoeba per se. So that was a prototype that was being developed in 89, 90, uh, the confocal that we were working on in Georgetown. So that's about it. I think uh, things have moved a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Maipal. Uh, I think that you're first and foremost a cornea person and then the other things come into place. <laughs> we can claim you. So uh, there's just... Uh, <laughs> Just a couple of uh, questions around the same point, and then I think that, that we'll close the questions for now. The, these questions are around the same point that since it's in the US, at least it's up to contact lens usage. And it's probably this Dr. Jagdish has asked a very important point that uh, do they first come to the ophthalmologist or to the optometrist? And the second point is that once it does heal, uh, do you put them back on contact lenses? What do you do? Oh, that's a very good question, actually. I, I think the if you look statistically, uh, acanthamoeba patients usually go through an average of three or four eye care professionals before coming to a diagnosis. So the answer is yes, they actually do present uh, to primary care uh, ophthalmologists and optometrists. So it's not something that is unheard of. As far as getting back into contact lenses, it's really shocking that these patients are always asking that on their first visit when they can get back into their lenses often when they don't have a lot of pain. And the answer to that is, is Curious. I mean, as I mentioned, there may be some predilection uh, or susceptibility of certain patients to acanthamoeba keratitis. And uh, the incidence of patients having recurrent um, or new episodes is really higher than you would expect based on the population average. So I always make them aware of that. But the most important thing is they need to do something differently. And going into 
daily disposable lenses, for example. Uh, they, they may not have a decreased incidence of bacterial infection, but uh, the chances of uh, contamination are much less. Uh, and they really have to change their practices if they want to go back into contact lenses. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll uh, go to the case, which is also a case on Acanthabiba. And if uh, Parikshit could just uh, bring that in for me. Maybe Parikshit is... Uh, uh, so, uh, the next case is by Dr. Nick. Unmute, Patricia. Unmute. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Nikhil Gokhale needs no introduction. Dr. Nikhil is a leading cornea surgeon from Mumbai and a star of our Maharashtra of Thermology Society award in Konya in this part of the country. Feroz, we cannot hear you in case you're not unmuted yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can now, Feroz. Yeah, hi. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, the president of Konya Society of India and the past president of Bombay Ophthalmologist Society, uh, the young and uh, excellent academician, Dr. Nikhil S. Gokhale from Gokhale Eye Hospital. Apart from being a Konya specialist and an academician, I realized that he is a taxonomist as well. So I hope it's more to do with plant taxonomy or probably a cornea taxonomist as well. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Nikhil, and please answer this question of mine. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, so I thank the IOS Scientific Committee and uh, Dr. Somashila for me uh, to be here today with all of you. Uh, she wanted me to present a case that I've managed during the pandemic. Uh, and I, in fact, have uh, been managing two patients of acanthamoeba ulcers. And I'll be showing you this particular case, which was a really difficult situation for me. And uh, he's still undergoing treatment, although it's not fully complete. Uh, so this was how the patient came to me. He was uh, a 44 year old gentleman with uh, diabetes and uh, he just said categorically that uh, he had only five days history of uh, redness, irritation and he was using uh, commercial uh, steroid antibiotic drops and uh, subsequently uh, he developed this ulcer and he was referred immediately by the local uh, ophthalmologist to me. Uh, so, basically he had a ring infiltrate which was uh, all around with a large epithelial defect and uh, which was sparing the central uh, cornea of course. Uh, looking at this picture with a short history anyway, uh, as a routine I sent all the smears and cultures and uh, I started the patient on uh, levofloxacin and atropine. Uh, however, at 48 hours the reports were negative, there was nothing in the uh, slides or the growth and the patient was worsening on day 3 and day 5 uh, following this. So I put the patient on uh, vancomycin and fortified topramycin. By one week there was absolutely no response to antibiotics. The epithelial defect was total. Uh, at this point of time I thought it would be wiser to take a second opinion and do a repeat microbiology at a different uh, setup. So I sent him to one of my colleagues who again repeated the same uh, protocols for microbiology. However, uh, again the results were negative. At this point of time the patient decided it was enough and uh, he was not willing to travel or take any further opinion or testing. Then returned back to me on uh, about uh, day 18. At 
this point of time he was uh, significantly worse with now 360 degree uh, limbal involvement uh, so i had to talk to him and motivate him for one last workup which was only going to be smears and uh, i had to talk to the microbiologist to see and tell him that uh, probably uh, we are losing his eye and uh, we need to really look at the slides and uh, you know check what's happening and at that point of time uh, he told me that there is acanthamoeba in the calcophor staining uh, the same day uh, i started the patient on uh, chlorhexidine and uh, phnb and uh, continued his uh, tobramycin and atropine uh, uh, and uh, continued to follow up and within a week of the anti acanthamoeba therapy he actually looked still worse uh, there was significant inflammation inside the anterior chamber with some fibrin like reaction Uh, there was annular uh, guttering and uh, limbal involvement with uh, extension looking as if onto the sclera uh, at this point of time i uh, added oral doxycycline and uh, was considering whether we can apply a glue onto the uh, thin area 9 days later the picture looks still worse he is continuing to go downhill uh, there was scleral inflammation as well patient's pain was manageable with oral diclofenac uh, somehow i could not manage to do a glue bandage lens because i was alone in the clinic at that point of time and the lockdown was uh, just going on at that time uh, another two weeks passed and uh, the thinning at the limbus was only getting worse with active scleral inflammation uh, despite the anti acanthamoeba therapy so i sent an sos call to my mumbai onia colleagues and i was lucky that uh, one of my colleague in a multi speciality hospital could do a little bit of debridement and uh, do at the uh, limbus so as to support the thin area uh, about 3 weeks later uh, most of the glue was not there in place and actually there was a panus and a vascularization all around Uh, the glue uh, had more or less uh, sloughed off the bandage lens was still there the eye was looking quieter the scleritis had uh, come down to some extent and i reduced the frequency of medication uh, three weeks down further this is day 94 of treatment and uh, day 77 on acanthamoeba treatment when i saw him last a few days back uh, there was conjunctivalization all around Uh, there was a centrally overhanging uh, corneal tissue i think the vessels are invading below it and uh, this is how the corneal uh, overhanging lip is there uh, he has a no pain now the scleral inflammation is settled but there is clear thinning all around as you can see and i expect that uh, over a period of uh, next few weeks he will have a totally conjunctivalized surface uh, with probably underlying scarring and thinning some of the thoughts that came to my mind uh, as i made this presentation was that uh, one of the factors that uh, the patient's very short history of 5 days made me think that this was a fulminant infection and uh, when smears are negative for fungus uh, i believed it was more probably bacterial in origin so i was trying to give antibiotics however when the microbiology was negative at two centers i felt i was probably wrong uh and maybe that this could have been an acanthamoeba uh down here i must confess that sometimes we still need to talk to our uh, microbiologist and uh, we need to keep discussing with them otherwise uh, sometimes the re technicians report and uh, sometimes the reports are not uh, you know negative and uh, even after so many years in practice i think i'm still learning from every new patient that i see some of the questions that came to my mind were that uh, in a cornea practice at least is there any role of uh, starting empirically anti acanthamoeba therapy I, i feel it's may not be a safe option for general ophthalmologists uh, without a proper diagnosis uh, i myself of course uh, do start this treatment when i see radial neuritis or a very typical uh, pattern but uh, short history i think was something that made me uh, go wrong i don't know whether it is reported to get it so quickly such advanced disease uh, would anyone have done a keratoplasty if corneas were available at any point of time during its treatment uh, any systemic medication as elmer mentioned maybe uh, voriconazole or any other drug uh, would
should have helped or should have been used uh, would anyone use oral steroids in such a case for the scleritis uh, considering that we were able to manage his pain it wasn't very unbearable and uh, maybe once the surface heals after a year or two years would uh, some, someone uh, maybe tell us if uh, surface reconstruction or keratoplasty is possible in uh, such a severe uh, you know uh, sort of pathology and i must thank uh, dr devang dr suresh and dr jyoti prakash the microbiologist for helping me in uh, treating this case and i think the coronavirus seem to be harder than the acanthamoeba in the current pandemic and i just wait for the good times to come back again thank you Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, Nikhil. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, um, he asked all the perfect questions. <laughs> all five, <laughs> I think, are the most difficult. Uh, I think there is a role for empiric therapy. I mean, I, if you don't have microbiologic backup for it, even in those patients that are negative, I think they're using them. They're relatively safe, honestly. The topicals and they're broad spectrum, and they do have activity against fungi and bacteria as well. Um, in this particular case, I think one of the reasons it may be fulminant, uh, as I mentioned, patients who have either a large load of acanthamoeba or if they have a co-infection. So this, this patient may have had a bacterial um, infection that was acting as prey that um, it's been shown experimentally that acanthamoeba that, that uh, either have endosymbionts or in areas where there's bacteria or other food sources they become much more pathogenic, much more inflammatory. So I think that's probably uh, at least a portion of what you experienced here in this particular patient. Five days without question is very short, um, but I think that those are probably two factors you'd wanna look at. Um, I think oral medications in a patient who has deep disease like this, I would try to start them initially if at all possible. Uh, I'm trying to remember your other two questions. Um, what were the other two, the last two? The other question was about keratoplasty, whether uh, at any point one would consider and oral steroids, because, you know, scleritis is something that some people, uh, you know, advise to use oral steroids. So in such a situation... Uh, I think you want, once you had the patient under therapy, um, you know, appropriate therapy, that steroids would have, been, would have been a consideration. And the reason for that is the scleral thinning that you think you see there. It's going to be very difficult to do a transplant uh, with no uh, foundation. Uh, and then also that inflammation has probably destroyed the ciliary body so that they're relatively hypotenuse now. And so the eye may be pre by the time you get into the possibility of surgery. Um, so I think steroids are a necessary evil at some stage, um, but you have to make a decision whether the eye is going to survive the infection or not. And it's going to be one or the other uh, in that particular case. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Muscatine. Yeah, I was just saying that I wanted to, one take home message which I want to give everyone listening is that unlike what Elmer II stated in the US, in India we see more than 50% of our acanthamoeba without any contact lens. In fact, there's a paper from South India where they found it more in farmers who are working bare feet in very muddy waters and that muddy water splashing uh, caused the acanthamoeba. Uh, Nikhil again showed a comorbidity. We learned to be very familiar with the word comorbidity because of COVID. But comorbidity in this case was diabetes. So again, the, 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 the diabetes may be fluctuant, not well controlled. So these are the patients that we see. And, and I, I too have, uh, from all the acanthamoeba that I've seen, have seen more without contact lens history than with a contact lens history. Uh, the treatment part has all been when well elucidated. You talked about uh, 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 keratoplasty in the later stage. The, Elmer talked about the uh, keratoplasty, which would be very difficult uh, with the guttering that you had to do in the initial stage. But in the later stage, after everything is all healed and it's not, suppose it doesn't go into pre thysical and it remains uh, uh, normal, uh, you could do uh, uh, keratoplasty, of course, with a peridectomy and, and all sorts of things, knowing that the limbal stem cells are fired, knowing that the sclera may be involved, that the, there might be cyclitis post-op. So with very guarded prognosis, yes, you could attempt if the PL is good. Uh, at some point, if, if 
after one keratoplasty i would then go in for a boston uh, uh, keratoprosthesis so i am i am uh, uh, low low uh, level of uh, uh, inducement i i jump easily into boston pk but uh, uh, but here here i would i would still do a uh, first a pk and then go as a second stage into a boston keratoprosthesis provided everything else was okay thanks Uh, there are a lot of questions on what else can we use because uh, PHMB is not certainly not available in pharmacies, and though chlorhexidine is, but yeah. uh, the question I have been using I have been using my daughter is a dentist I have been using triclosan, which is supposed to be according to my daughter a little uh, better than uh, for dentists. They prefer triclosan to chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is also a mouthwash, so I have been using uh, triclosan very empirically uh, diluting the. Uh, dental uh, mouthwash as one in ten, and and using this uh, sometimes in desperate situations. In Mumbai, we do get the uh, propamidine available. Uh, Golden Eye and Broline are some of the trade names that we get this from time to time. But otherwise, I have jumped from chlorhexidine to triclosan. Uh, Elmer, you have actually studied the uh, uh, the role of BAK rather than the actual molecule. Could you just say that once again for the benefit of the audience? Uh, BAK actually, for certain strains of acanth amoebas, is as effective as hydrogen peroxide, which is uh, actually fairly um, helpful. The only problem with um, benzoconium chloride is it doesn't penetrate well into the corneal stroma. But in the early stages, uh, it can probably reduce epithelial spread and, and treat the superficial disease much more effectively. Um, But experimentally, it uh, it kills both trithozoites and cysts, and so if if, if you have nothing avail else available, you you can at least start with that before they get to someone who can um, get you the compounded medications. Uh, I have a question for Almer. Yes, yes. Sir. can I ask one question? Uh, yes. Would uh, cross linkage help in these patients? <laughs> I left that out of my talk. Um, the It's one of those things where it probably has some benefit in the very early stages, um, but once it gets to a deeper stage, um, crosslinking will not reach the deeper areas of the cornea where where it resides, and it actually will cause a significant uptick in inflammation, sometimes catastrophically so. So, I think an early disease is an adjunctive therapy it can be a good stabilizer. Um, But I, most of the evidence suggests that if it's uh, a deeper disease, especially that by the time it's uh, diagnosed, that the crosslinking has limited utility there. Because I consider, you know, if you do in early stages, it may have a value because these acanthamoeba, uh, uh, you know, trophozoites will be, you know, eating the keratocytes. Mm -hmm. So if you do a early stage uh, intervention. uh maybe a uh, cross linking even i can you know think of doing a, a dal type of procedure mm -hmm. which can take you know the, the infection load from the eye and uh, looking into a medical treatment is not great in these cases so early a surgical intervention may be the choice some in some cases yeah i think there quite a few of us in the panelists who would agree on dal dr namrata uh, rishi bupesh quite a few of us actually early dal Other than prolonging, only dal can also it would you would prevent the scleritis in going into the, you know going into the beyond the limbus into the sclera when you can actually do little about it except for giving steroids and immuno immunosuppressing it. So we'll uh, move on to the last segment. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of our initial uh, investigation, we all do a uh, you know confocal microscopy uh, in these cases and that gives you a real clue for you uh, know doing uh, uh, the uh, management for such patients. that's a very good point thank you sir uh thank you very much uh, professor elmer too and uh, thanks to dr kurish maskari for discussing this wonderful case uh, so well presented by nikhil and uh, uh, so well managed i must say nikhil whatever the outcome is unfortunately in the pandemic very the pandemic exactly yeah uh, we we'll move on to the last session and again uh, parikshit i request you to queue in the next speakers is uh, dr bhupesh bag a cornea consultant from lv prasad so we have somebody to introduce him so we have our next speaker dr bhupesh bagga 
He is a consultant in cornea cataract services and children's eye care hospital in Alu Prasad Eye Institute at Hyderabad. He did his follow fellowship from the same institute. In addition to his clinical work, he is a researcher, and his research work is focused on corneal ulcer treatment. He is also involved in managing pediatric corneal disorders and complex ocular surface diseases. He is an investigator of grants related to HSV keratitis and phytum keratitis funded by ICMR and DST. He has been actively involved in teaching residents and fellows. So over to you, Dr. Bupesh, Dr. Bupesh Bagga. First, hello. Good evening, everyone, and uh, good evening. Hope I was audible. Yes, sir. We can hear you. No. Uh, my slides are. No. Just waiting, Bupesh. Nikhil, Nikhil has to know. Stop share uh, screen first. That. Yes, Bupesh, you're in. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, again uh, to AIO Scientific Committee and especially Dr. Somshila for the kind invitation and uh, uh, giving me opportunity to present my case. So I'm going to present a case of uh, Pythium keratitis. Uh, it was actually 41 year old female who presented in 2016 from Prayagraj, Uttar Pradesh with a redness, painful decrease in vision, uh, along with white discoloration of the left eye since uh, past one month with a vague history of giving something fall in, during cooking one month back. So she was actually diagnosed and managed as microbial keratitis as a citrobacter uh, grown in the culture, which was which she was carrying the med medical report and which was sensitive to moxifloxacin, erythromycin and all, and uh, resistant to ciprofloxacin and ofloxacin. So based upon that and uh, other uh, clinical features, the treating uh, cornea specialist has started on voriconazole uh, one hourly and moxifloxacin one hourly, along with atropine and tablet estrozolomide. So this was the, uh, I'm going directly to the cornea picture. This was the clin clinical picture of the cornea which you can see uh, with a dense infiltrate over this area. This area is almost thinning around 70%, which uh, unfortunately slit is not on that. But the important thing is there is a guttering around the infiltrate all around. This area is relatively clearer with fine tentacular-like lesions with extensions, with circumcellary congestion, and uh, these are the points which I was trying to tell. So based upon that, we made diagnosis of microbial keratitis and uh, uh, differential based upon the history of one month with the citrobacter grown in culture ex from elsewhere, but worsening on antibiotics, worsening on antifungals, the history of trauma while cooking something, so clinical pictures, which I just mentioned, like fine tentacles are favoring either fungal or pythium, but she was worsening on antifungals. Peripheral guttering along with going for pythium was, as well as fungus both, but more towards pythium keratitis. Pinhead lesions are more for pythium as well as fungus both. So our differentials are in between the fungus or pythium, or it can be mixed infection as citrobacter, which is a like a, a gram negative bacteria grown uh, from somewhere else. So if you just think about the pythium keratitis, this is a plaque-like lesion, the typical lesion presents like a plaque-like lesion, whitish lesion with granular and uh, surrounding granularity. If you carefully look, you'll see some fine tentacles and pinhead lesions around that plaque. And similarly, in other patient, like presenting like in hypopion, but common things is the raised plaque and a guttering along with fine tentacles and very fine tentacle and pinhead lesions. Clinically, both are, uh, are looking similar, but few difference are there, which are like in Pythium, you see fine tentacular lesions, which are very thick and uh, very fluffy in terms of, in cases of fungus, but in early cases of fungus <clears throat> still can mimic 
pythium keratitis. You won't see guttering like this in early stages of fungal keratitis, but you do see sort of guttering around the infiltrate and raised plaque in pythium keratitis. So we scraped and we got uh, uh, filaments. I would just say filaments, but if you see the filaments are, if I am marking here, this filament is like this with only one clean septa I can see. Rest all are aseptate or sparsely septate, which is more clearer in KOH, which is like a aseptate band without seeing any septate. And the classical fold, like which you see here, which is very evident in KOH, which is not very clear in the grams. So if based upon that, we are actually seeing a broad branching aseptate, sparsely ribbon-like uh, uh, filament. On microbiologically, we can differentiate these two organisms, but yes, there are certain patients we are actually uh, not able to differentiate very clearly, but in majority wise, we can see more septae and thinner filaments in terms of fungus, but sparsely septate or aseptate in terms of pythium. Both organisms are different in structure of cell membrane also, and the important thing is that fungus has ergosterol, but pythium doesn't have. So that actually uh, gives that why this patient, if on pythium, is not responding to oriconazole. Second thing is the growth on the chocolate agar is very, very faint as in contrast to uh, fungus, which is actually very clear. In pythium, you see very submerged thin uh, growth with radiating edges, which when we transfer from chocolate agar to uh, aqueous media with some uh, garnish and leaves, we can actually generate uh, spores from the sporangia. So this actually confirms the diagnosis of that we are dealing with the pythium. So if you to make a diagnosis, we are having clinical signs of tentacles, pinhead lesions, guttering and plaque with worsening on antifungals, with smears showing aseptate, sparsely septate, ribbon-shaped filaments with culture and zoospore formation, actually towards pythium keratitis. That's all. So now we have made a diagnosis of pythium keratitis. So pythium is basically a oomycete, which was actually initially diagnosed uh, as a fungus. Uh, but later on, when we actually come to know that actually forming spores, and this is the technique of form spores, which actually come out to be a oomycete. So it was initially diagnosed as hyphomycosis destruens, which literally means that is a fungus which destroys literally everything. It is a human pathiosis, basically a disease to start with tropical and subtropical countries as well as temperate. But we do see cases from other all over world. Now we have case reports from all over world uh, of human pathiosis. Human pathiosis actually can be described in four categories, but most common is vascular and second most common is ocular. The most important risk factor in terms of non-ocular is the thalassemia hemoglobinopathy, while in ocular pathiosis is related to water. Rainy season is increased incidence, farming exposure, direct contact with water resource, and there are plenty of case reports with the use of contact lens use along with the uh, uh, pythium. So it's not only acanthamoeba, which is very commonly associated with this, pythium is also coming uh, with second uh, very important organism. Coming to management point of view, initially it was, it was diagnosed as unidentified fungus, so it always been treated as with antifungals and then worsen. So this study actually, if you see the 30 out of 30, 14 patients got enucleation or revisceration, but they came out to the conclusion that if you do early surgery, actually you can salvage the globe, but not visually outcome. This study from India actually says that from 46, 42 actually went uh, surgery, but out of that 42 patients, 26 got very bad recurrence. So they also advise that early surgical intervention is the most important. So for this patient and for Pythium per se, the uncertainty exists that uncertain response with medical treatment, outcome of surgical treatment is also very poor and high chance of recurrence of infection, poor graft survival. So what to offer for to our patient? Like if you see that, Patient, our patient was having late presentation, advanced keratitis, as well as central stromal thinning. So most of us think about that we should go for early keratoplasty or now the early late is there, so we should go for keratoplasty. But some of us thinking that why should not try medical treatment? So based upon uh, the drug susceptibility testing, which we performed in our lab, we come out to a protocol to treat uh, pythium and sedosum keratitis medically, and we managed to see some 14, 15 patients, and we published in 2018, 
this paper in video based upon this initial experience so uh, uh, we thought of trial of medical management with uh, patient counseled about that and observe for thinning with explained prognosis that we patient definitely may may or may not require therapeutic ketoplasty because of high recurrence rate we try medical treatment so we tried with the combination of linozolid along with erythromycin ointment along with oral erythromycin tablet so this was the patient at presentation after 3 days if you see that little thinning is uh, more clear with little bit of consolidation of the endoexudate which now appearing now with a haze of 14 days the difference is little bit obvious that this cornea which was little bit of fuzzy actually started clearing up and to our excitation this uh, central cornea also was getting clearer but the thinning progress so we applied tissue adhesive with very close follow up that still that patient may need therapeutic ketoplasty early but on follow up they started consolidating with uh, vessels as uh, dr nikhil's patient of acanthamoeba patient is started same consolidating as a plaque which i am just thinking that why uh, both are behaving as exactly like a similar way and then uh, is after 105 days it became like a central plaque which i removed surgically and applied tissue adhesive which after 150 days it's completely healed so we make a strategy that we should try antibiotic even in the large large pythium keratitis rather than going for uh, treatment surgical treatment and if it worsen then go for treatment so we recently uh, uh, this paper recently got accepted in ophthalmology where we described that it can present as like in four format whether like this 4a 4b 4c is the like our patient 3a 3b c is like without formation of plaque and just uh, resolve like other microbial keratitis but 2a 2b c and 1 is actually a different way that one actually worsened on medical therapy and we large therapeutic graft was required in this patient but second improved but central perforated during the healing process and we need sort of optical ketoplasty so this way it it responded so rupi so, yeah I, i'm done so this is a uh, one year follow up of this patient and this is the follow up recently uh, follow up of four, three and a half year where i performed pk plus ecc pcil for this patient with regaining of very good visual acuity so with the strategic treatment we can gain a very good outcome for even for very worse complication thank you very much thank you bupesh i think you not really left too many questions but uh, we do know that dr navrata sharma has also managed these cases uh, dr navrata would you please uh, uh, i just want to know what antibiotics you use the same protocol that you have been advocating linozolid topical and uh, yeah and uh, so, so actually i i have a feeling that it's it's kind of a confused management because uh, some people matlab what i mean to say is like you are advocating antibacterials and then there's a paper which is published by arvind who advocate uh, anti fungal therapy and then there's a paper published by sn which says that uh, cryotherapy and surgery so we got confused so, in all three of them so, so of course your case was managed extremely well and a great presentation into insights of pcm keratitis guttering like you said is very important feature reticulated pattern or those tentacles again very important i think now even if we see guttering and reticulated pattern as you showed we just you know uh, we we are very uh, preemptive that it might be pythium keratitis so i think the the treatment part still needs to be you know uh, clarified further uh, because uh, antibacterial vis-a-vis antifungal vis-a-vis so uh, based upon the arvind paper which you are quoting the response is uh, same as as th- uh, the taiwan paper or thailand paper which i was quoting though they also said the rec- the results are uh, almost uh, nil they almost every patient more than 90% responded uh, needed uh, therapeutic ketoplasty so based upon our experience of the first paper in 2018 which we published so 90 a 2% patient undergone uh, actually therapeutic ketoplasty but after that actually respond only 10 to 12% patient uh, needed therapeutic ketoplasty the paper which uh, is recently approved actually is uh, explaining that strategic uh, treatment which i was uh, trying to explain and uh, the shankar group actually is uh, tar- 
is actually trying to uh, say that therapeutic pk along with adjuvant treatment alcohol yeah. and cryotherapy which they are trying is actually helping for pythian pancreatitis but in in that also the recurrence chances are there but in our patient in our series the there is no recurrence even after going for therapeutic ketoplasty even out of uh, 32 patients only 5 patient grew from grew pythium after ketoplasty so suggest that treatment is actually working and now this has been uh, confirmed by animal trials as well because we have done animal trial for uh, for pythium and now our third paper is on on review so maybe that also will highlight and uh, uh, confirm of the finding which which i am trying to tell so there is no confusion in in actually in our mind that pythium can be managed in this way and should be managed in this way because this is the way it is behaving so well, we have almost 160 patients outcome which is going to be published soon so probably that will also clarify the uh, the result dr somshila do i have a split second to ask a question to bupesh i know we are running a bit late yes radhika yes yeah, so the only question i had to uh, bupesh was that i uh, totally commend you on the success that you have with the medical management uh, we have not really been that lucky in our cases the question that i have for you uh, is that these cases are uh, PCR proven pythium, or uh, what uh, did you base your diagnosis of pythium on uh, when you put them on medical treatment and uh, this so, outcome came? Yeah, so uh, all these cases we are not doing PCR now. So we are actually only uh, seeing like smear as I showed, as well as zoo spore production in all cases. Thank you, Bupesh. Thank you very much, Radhika. Uh, thanks, Bupesh. I think that is excellent case. Thank you, Dr. Namrata, for discussing it, and Radhika for your comments. Uh, we'll move on to the next presentation, and Parikshit will help me there. Uh, it's Aditya Pradhan, a dynamic person from Calcutta. So we have all the Bengal contingent present in spite of the cyclone here. somebody is introducing then yeah he or she has to unmute yeah uh, dr aditya pradhan uh, is a young and dynamic cornea specialist from uh, disha eye hospitals calcutta he is uh, numerous awards to his credit he has been young achiever award iskaras 2016 and also won think under the apple tree from aioc in 2018 he is also reviewer for cornea and external diseases for indian journal of ophthalmology and section editor for cornea for aios times as well as section editor for cornea for tjo tjo sr over to you dr aditya prathan please thank you sir for the kind introduction uh, i'll just stop your screen sharing yeah i'll do that so i would like to begin my case presentation thank you somashila ma'am and aios scientific committee for the kind opportunity so i have no financial interest in any of the products in this presentation so this was a saga of around 11 months in all starting from october 2016 when this gentleman of 65 years he was residing in west bengal about 250 kilometers from the base hospital at barakpur He was a farmer by occupation. He came with the chief complaints of diminution of vision, redness, and pain in his left eye. The history was that he had, while working in his field, he had a trauma to his left eye by a wooden stick three weeks prior, and he was treated by about two or three ophthalmologists. I was the fourth one, and all of them had done some form of microbiological workup in the form of corneal scraping and KOS stain, and he was getting topical as well as. systemic antifungals before he presented to our hospital the important point was no indigenous medicines that is local treatment or steroids were given by any of the prior ophthalmologists and the interesting point that the right eye was lost due to a similar injury while working in the field about 10 years ago and basically it was an empty socket the eye had become thysical so if you go to the clinical picture this was the presentation that you can see a total limbus to limbus corneal ulcer with a thick hypopion that is filling almost half of the anterior chamber with a very central dense infiltrate which is also extended to the periphery 
so the vision was only positive perception of light and considering that the one eight status the prior three weeks of treatment with antifungals both topical and systemic the decision was taken to undergo an immediate therapeutic keratoplasty in that left eye uh, fortunately the syringing was patented in both the eyes the surgery was performed by me on the same day under local anesthesia uh, the diameter of the graft was about 12 mm and the lens was preserved on the table this clinical photograph is at day 7 after the therapeutic keratoplasty the uncorrected visual acuity was 1 by 60 the culture of the host corneal tissue showed the growth of fusarium the species could not be identified along with that the ac was well formed there was a nuclear sclerosis cataract of grade 4 and he was continued on oral and topical antifungals along with cycloplegics a broad spectrum antibiotic and uh, artificial tears for four times a day to reduce the irritation caused by the sutures so this is basically a timeline starting from one month after the therapeutic keratoplasty where we cautiously started the topical steroids the iop and the visual acuity were pretty stable about 6 weeks after the therapeutic graft we are continuing the steroids however at around day 60 that is two months after the surgery the patient suddenly presented with a mild reduction in the vision and increased redness which had subsided due to the steroids given earlier but now the redness had returned on probing and prodding and some questioning the patient did admit that he had run out of the drops since the past one week and there was a focal endothelial scar this linear scar marks on the cornea which i will show in the next slide so we in stepped up the topical treatment the steroids especially and asked him to report again he was lost to follow up at 3 months after the initial keratoplasty the steroids were going on there was focal pass in two quadrants of the graft the density of the nucleus sclerosis was gradually increasing with pinhole he was able to see 6 by 60 however the details of the fundus were not clear around 133 days after the initial keratoplasty the process was ongoing the patient was almost regular in his follow ups and compliant with the drops however we were able to see that the endothelial morphology was not very clear i do not have the specular photograph to share with you unfortunately but the cells although they were seen the machine was not able to count them and the morphology was not very healthy so in our mind we were thinking that this patient would end up with a graft failure eventually considering there was a small graft rejection episode earlier at 2 months after the keratoplasty so we gave this option both to ourselves and to the patient that yes he may end up recovering another keratoplasty with simultaneous extraction of the cataract and an implantation of the iol at around day 214 that is almost 7 uh, months after the initial keratoplasty the vision was dropping the cataract density was increasing however due to severe financial con constraints he was not willing to undergo for a triple procedure and so we thought of that okay let's go just ahead with the cataract surgery and the iol and then do a dissect or some other form of keratoplasty later on if needed the patient and his relatives agreed to this thought process so yes this is day 214 as you can see the cataract density has quite gone and these are the linear endothelial scarring i was talking about in one small area of the graft and so the patient was awaiting cataract surgery yes the endothelial health was doubtful but considering the limited choices for visual rehabilitation especially was one aid so we did decide to go ahead with the cataract surgery here i would like to emphasize that i did refer this patient to a colleague of mine he is dr arup bhome a very senior cataract consultant at our hospital because the density of the cataract and my surgical expertise as a cataract surgeon were not in tandem so i decided that this has to be taken care by a very senior cataract surgeon so as you can see he did go under undergo cataract surgery with a single piece hydrophobic iol on day 7 of the cataract the visual acuity with pinhole was 6 by 18 there was as this endothelial scar, scarring as mentioned earlier he was on steroids a broad spectrum antibiotic and artificial tears we could see the fundus very clearly for the first time after the keratoplasty it was very healthy and the iop was also normal so this is cataract post of day 56 
almost two months after the cataract surgery. Visual acuity of 618 with a minus 2.25 cylinder. And the drops and the steroids were continued. Everything was fine. Around three months after the cataract surgery, again presented with complaints of reduced vision and pain in one week. He was not seen by me, but another branch of the hospital by another cornea colleague. And the visual acuity had dropped from 6 by 18 to 5 by 60. There was severe graft edema, cells flare in the anterior chamber. The, diagnosis, the working diagnosis was an episode of acute graft rejection. This would be the second episode. The IOP had also shot up, so it was managed medically. And the patient came back to me. This was 112 days after the cataract. Vision had, uh, had dropped, actually, further. The reaction, AC reaction had reduced. The IOP had become acceptable, but the graft edema was persistent. We could tell that it was headed towards failure. So we planned a slow taper of the steroids and what had been discussed earlier, that is another graft for the patient. But the saga ends here. The patient did not show up after this. In spite of you know repeated requests over the phone and other ways to communicate with him, but it did not show up after this. So this is the end of the presentation. These are the learning and the discussion points which would I think be taken up by the moderators that add some questions and you know how would anybody else approach this case? So yeah. one is the history taking, uh, one is the, yeah. I'll just stop you here so we can go yeah. to the moderators. Yeah. Uh, mainly here, I think more than the history taking, uh, which everybody is is aware of, I guess. But the, the the second question you have is very interesting: the threshold of surgical intervention. So we'll ask the moderators for your uh, talk to take over. Uh, the mod your case is to be moderated by Dr. Kurish Maskuti and uh, Dr. Mahipal Sachdev. Yeah. So. Uh, uh... Can I go, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, I, I agree with Aditi. I also have a very low threshold. I would jump in straight and do for a one-eyed patient. Uh, I would do exactly what he did, a therapeutic uh, PK. Points to be noted. Very correctly, he left the uh, lens in place. Don't try and combine it with a cataract surgery in an infected uh, cornea. Many people, especially youngsters, feel that the, we might as well get the lens out at the same time. Chances of endophthalmitis will increase if there could be a PC rent and things like that. So do one thing at, at a time. Uh, I, and uh, uh, coming to the second part of your uh, talk, when you talked about the uh, uh, to do a DSEC triple, I would have uh, preferred to do what you did ultimately. Just do it in a one-eyed patient, go very slow, just do a cataract extraction. The point is you can always go in and do a, a, a graft later on, whether it's a DSEC uh, or a DMEC or whatever it is. Uh, so I, I, your case has been managed exactly as you would and uh, as, as you've done so far. And uh, it's a tragedy that he hasn't come back to you. Otherwise, I think by doing a DSEC now after a second uh, graft rejection, you could have again brought him to 618 or better. Mahipal. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Kuresh, and uh, thank you, Aditya, for a nice presentation. Actually, as Kuresh said, I would agree totally with uh, him that the management has been done as per uh, what was expected. The first thing is that if you have such a huge fungal load and you have uh, something not responding to medical and systemic therapy, as you were saying that that patient had already been on antifungals, and nadamycin uh, normally uh, does not penetrate so deep. Uh, what uh, uh, RP Center, Namrata and other people have described as also uh, uh, from other centers, that is the uh, uh, injection of uh, voriconazole that would not have worked in this particular case because the cornea was uh, tending to be very melty. Uh, so I would uh, agree with you that under such cases, uh, there is uh, nothing that uh, either form of therapy, whether it is topical, whether it is intralesional, whether it is systemic is going to achieve. It is going to remain there, uh, the infection, and it is going to spread, and then it could have become a scleritis, panophthalmitis, endophthalmitis, whatever uh, it could have progressed. So I think you did the very wise thing, and obviously you have to take an oversized graft, and when you are doing such a large graft, so 0.75 to 1 millimeter oversizing has to be there. Uh, one thing that could have been done, I don't know whether you did it in the surgery, is that at times we would prefer to do a slight peritomy to actually see the extent of the infection, the fungal infection as to how much it has spread. 
uh, at times also the hypopion can give you a false impression as to the extent of the fungal in, uh, uh, infection so that also also needs to be taken care of peripheral iridectomy i would do two of them because it's a large graft and as you said uh, pass etc has formed in such cases which are large grafts you definitely uh, would uh, these patients would be definitely more prone to a graft rejection because uh, obviously you are nearer to the limbus and the vasculature and the antigenic challenge goes uh, what is important is that in such large grafts that you have doing an endothelial keratoplasty uh, is possible when you are doing an endothelial keratoplasty a cataract uh, if that was one of the questions a cataract i would have done through a scleral incision but if i have to combine it with a uh, uh, triple procedure that means an ek with the, a cataract then i might have uh, done a corneal approach because it's slightly easier for the uh, uh, the uh, dissect to be done through a corneal approach than a scleral approach so i think overall uh, the only thing uh, i would have maybe uh, after the uh, uh, the infection was not there you started him on steroids i may have kept him more aggressively on steroids for a longer period and also after the cataract surgery i would have kept him on steroids and cycloplegics for a longer time because at times there are endothelial down regulators that are produced by the ciliary body uh, in the form of 12r heat 12s heat etc that down regulates the endothelium and the edema sets in so i normally always prefer to keep the steroids post cataract surgery in compromised uh, endotheliums Uh, for a much longer time along with a cycloplegic and pressure lowering uh, medicine along with that and obviously you were giving lubricants so all in all i think uh, you have managed the patient well and uh, nothing is lost even uh, if the patient comes now with an irreversible corneal edema you could uh, actually go ahead and do uh, endothelial keratoplasty with uh, great success what about the question on uh, role of cyclosporin tacrolimus is anybody using it for these cyclosporin in the first instance when you are looking at it from a graft rejection perspective the normally the concentration i think arvin people manufacture it uh, as 2% of cyclo uh, cyclosporin which is not very well tolerated so the normal concentrations of cyclosporin in any case take about 3 uh, 4 weeks to act and in any case in such large grafts they may not be of much use immediately because the the uh, challenge happens uh, pretty much uh, uh, in larger grafts so people do use it but it's uh, not a uh, something tacrolimus or uh, cyclosporin is not something very established i think uh, uh, the best is to have steroids but in this case you can't give steroids because of the fungal for a couple of weeks so cyclosporin in any case will take about 3 4 weeks to build up a concentration to it to act uh, the the tacrolimus the tacrolimus does act a little earlier than the uh, topical cyclosporin but uh, again cyclosporin is more a steroid sparing agent in such cases in like this i would prefer the actual steroids uh, nicholas put a comment saying that oral cyclosporin could be used i don't have any experience with that no topical cyclosporin we did a randomized control trial which had over 90 patients and we found that it didn't work as prophylactically also for graft reject rejection and otherwise also i prefer steroids in in grafts yeah So, and topical cyclosporin as an adjuvant to uh, steroid did not offer any extra, uh, you know, benefit uh, or any uh, benefit in terms of less graft rejection or less episodes. So, in our experience, it didn't work at all. Top topical cyclosporin, systemic cyclosporin. I think there are papers showing that it does, you know, might help. so i would rather go in for systemic than for topical i think i agree with nikhil on i that. think it's a psychological uh, advantage that a, a doctor may have that i am giving something but uh, i don't think there is enough evidence for us to say that they will reduce the incidence of rejection i don't know if anybody has any other experience on that somshila you are, you have to unmute yourself you are muted Uh, so, thank you, Dr. Mehta. I think very good points made by all of us. Thank you, Dr. Maskati, Dr. Maipal sir, and Dr. Namrata for chipping in. And Aditya, excellent case, very well managed, and uh, really you saved the eyesight. Rest, maybe restored it for this one-eyed individual. Parikshit, who do we have next? Yes. Now, thank you, Dr. Aditya. And now we have the second last uh, presenter for today, uh, Dr. Pranav Mori. uh dr pranav uh, well is from my city in pune but he is been trained in km mumbai uh aims uh, under dr titiyal and dr namrata and later in arvindai hospital madurai 
He's currently working as a cataract and cornea consultant in the Sayadri Hospital and his own Ayush Eye Clinic. And he also is a visiting faculty to two medical colleges uh, in Pune and PCMC. So over to you, Dr. Pranav. Unmute yourself and share your screen. Yes, you're on, Pranav. Just double, uh, just go to slide share. Audible? Barely. So to increase your uh, volume. Audio, please. Admin, please look into the Is audio. Is that good now? Is that good now? No, it's not good. Louder. Is this okay? Very good. Very good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening to all. Warm wishes from Pune. Uh, I wish to thank uh, AIS Scientific Committee and Dr. Somshila for having me here. Uh, it's a nostalgic feeling because I'm presenting a case after almost 12 years in front of my teachers, Professor Tityal and Professor Namrata. Uh, I hope they are a bit milder on me this time as compared to my good old residency days. Uh, the topic that I'm going to present is a case presentation on a young lady, 23-year-old lady uh, who was diagnosed with bilateral keratoconus. The right eye had uh, a heel hydrops, two years old heel hydrops with a significant amount of scarring, whereas the only seeing eye uh, which we had uh, was having a moderate keratoconus and I had offered her a Corazin cross-linking procedure for the one. Her best corrected visual acuity in that eye uh, was 636. There was no other predisposing factor, uh, no systemic associations to have uh, keratoconus. She didn't have any ATOP. She didn't have any other systemic conditions which could cause secondary keratoconus. Uh, the procedure that I opted for was uh, accelerated CS, uh, CXL with an epi off. Uh, the procedure went off pretty well in uh, classical aseptic precautions taken in an OT OR and uh, uneventful procedure. The patient did have some pain postoperatively, which is expected in an epi off uh, procedure. Uh, the immediate post op, the patient only had a BCL in C2 and no major complaints on day one. She was put on a routine protocol of antibiotics and lubricants in the immediate post operative period. This procedure, which I did, uh, was on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, so there was a Sunday where the patient was seen by my resident and fellow uh, initially. And they just reported back saying that the patient's pain has reduced and the patient is on a routine uh, post op course. So I, the patient was sent home on Sunday afternoon and uh, the patient had no complaints till Monday afternoon when the patient came back on day two with significant amount of pain. Ideally, uh, post C3R, if the patient is on a BCL for 48 hours, the pain should settle down and the patient should be much relaxed even if it's an epi off procedure with the BCL in C2. But the patient presented on a Monday afternoon around with pain, significant amount of pain now a lot of redness, quite an inflamed eye, and a, a lot of whitish lesions, which I'll show in the next slide. So this was the presenting feature on day two. Uh, quite ghastly to look at in a patient who has just undergone so-called not so invasive, minimally invasive uh, procedure for a refractive condition like a keratoconus. And this is very ghastly. I, I almost missed my heartbeats there when I saw this uh, in a post C3R patient. And uh, looking at these, these are nice elevated gelatinous lesions. The central lesion pretty much restricted to the area of epi-off zone. And a very nasty looking lesion to see on day two in a post C3R patient. Uh, I was really worried. So obviously uh, the epithelium had not healed off. There was an overlying ulcer defect. Uh, scrape the patients, send it for a microbiome assessment. Uh, the attending microbiologist in the hospital uh, reported it as gram-positive cocci. And therefore, this patient was started on as, as a normal empirical protocol without having a culture report. Put this patient on a fortified vancomycin with moxifloxacin, eye drop one hourly, uh, hoping that this patient will start responding. 
uh, we did send it for culture and sensitivity also as per the protocols. Uh, so I had to wait till the reports came in after 48 hours, which was on day four. And uh, the day four, the reports sent to me by the microbiologist suggested that the patient doesn't respond to vancomycin. He doesn't respond to any of the fluoroquinolones. So the primary drug of choices that I put in for such a ghastly situation in a minimally invasive procedure uh, were not going to work for me. So then I, assess, I went through the report and it just showed that the aminoglycosides is one of the groups which is working pretty well or has an intermediate sensitivity as compared to the ones which we had chosen, vancomycin or moxifloxacin. By day six, I think day five or day six, the patient walked into the clinic saying she's not feeling fine. However, we put this patient after day six on uh, this, uh, on amikacin two person because as per the culture reports, the patient started uh, was started on amikacin two person. As the time passed, uh, we did notice that the patient was responding pretty well, and uh, just taking some anecdotes or taking some inspiration from this cut study. Uh, performed at Arvindai Hospital, I decided to introduce a mild surface-acting, low-dose, low-potent steroid in the form of lotiprednol, itabonate. And this, uh, I started at a frequency of three times a day for the first three days, but I did keep this patient on a close follow-up. The epithelial defect had almost started to almost heal, but there was a significant amount of scarring and an inflammatory inf infiltration going on in the cornea, for which I then decided to put this patient on lotiprednol on day 14. The response that I actually noticed after... Uh, introducing lotoprenol was quite impressive and the scarring from the first day two image to the day 21 image, it just clearly says that introducing steroids at the right time have helped in a situation, a sticky situation, a nasty situation like this to salvage to a point there wherein by day 40, uh, I had a scar which was barely minimally visible, uh, not significantly hampering the visual acuity. She uncorrected visual acuity at day 40 was around 636 which uh, along with the scarring, I thought was <laughs> rather a more uh, reparative and much, much of a, a respite for going through uh, a post-operative infectious keratitis in a C3R. Uh, so quite a scary situation to start off with, but um, shouldn't lose faith in managing it, sticking to the protocols, going by the medicine, going by science, playing around with it, altering things as per uh, the reports come up has helped and making use of scientific research that has been provided to us through so many research trials has actually helped recover this outcome for us in a situation which looked very nasty and ghastly in a one night, nearly one night, I wouldn't say one night, but nearly one night person, patient, a young woman with uh, just a keratoconus and undergoing a C3R procedure. Uh, the thoughts that I had on my mind was, was epi off. So there has been an epi off versus epi on debate for a long time, uh, either of it are efficacious in terms of managing, managing uh, progression of keratoconus. But uh, having a look at this kind of a scenario, you generally don't want to see something like this. An epi off uh, versus epi on was, was something on my mind. Should I switch over to an epi on procedure pattern? Uh, is there a good time to start topical steroids? If epi, what would be a good time to start steroids? I usually would start topical steroids on day three after the BCL is off. Even if there is a minimal epithelial defect, I would still choose to put a low-dose uh, surface-acting lotiprednol kind of a molecule. And has anyone encountered a scenario? Because I was going through the literature then, uh, there are only 10 cases published worth considered as post-C3R infectious keratitis. There were 50% 50 of, 50 of them bacterial, few of them were fungal, and two of them were acanthamoeba. A one or two odd were herpetic. Uh, has anyone encountered a ghastly scenario like this of C3R, wherein probably sometimes you might have to like in acanthamoeba, where you want to do it as early as possible. Anyways, DALC is one of the considered procedures for uh, keratoconus. So I was just wondering if anybody would have thought of doing an LK, early LK, if this was not going to be responding or recalcitrant. So thanks, Pranav. We'll go to the uh, discussions, uh, Dr. Namta Sharma. I think uh, I'm proud of you. That case was managed very well. Uh, Thank you, it is uh, almost miraculous. Uh, having said that, uh, to, to answer your questions, epi off versus epi on is uh, on related risks. You did the right thing. I think epi off is the way to go because epi on is not that efficacious. And good time to start steroids. I think all of us now agree with the infiltrates that you get sometimes after collagen crosslinking. It is the day four or day three whenever the BCL is off and epithelization is complete. 
and i think that was the correct way of doing uh, that you first saw that whether it is responding or not and then take a subsequent decision on the surgery uh, we have done at least uh, in my memory that i can remember from anecdotal cases that we've had about four keratoplasties uh, which were lk 5050 and pk both and uh, i think the case was managed very well thank you so much thank you thank you dr titial uh, your experience on this particular entity Yeah, I think you know, uh, Parla uh, and Namrata have done very well. I'm very happy <laughs> to listen to this. And uh, we know that you know, uh, infection after CXL is not uncommon. Yeah. People do see such cases, and uh, as Parla rightly pointed out, it's really you know uh, heartbreaking sometimes to see a healthy keratoconus patient yeah. developing infection after two three days, and your entire outcome goes haywire in such cases. I think a few things are important because once we do a, a epithelial uh, debridement in these cases and uh, get all the defense mechanism of cornea to a rest, that means you have total loss of keratocyte. The entire cornea is a, like a, you know growth uh, medium for these uh, bacterial growth. So you have to be very careful to begin with. Do a proper asepsis for these patients. Maybe uh, give an antibiotic cover. Do a beta bin, uh, beta din watch for a longer period for these patients, and a proper uh, OT environment should be must for these cases because these these are like uh, you know uh, intravitreal injection nowadays. So if you have something going wrong in some, these patients, you had it. So some precaution has to be taken, and we know that infection can occur. So timely management, as Pranav showed in this particular case, is appropriately you know important for all of us. and getting a culture report and uh, having a sensitivity in your hand seeing a early uh, uh, response of medication the steroid ad was very nicely done in this particular case the people say once should be start steroid in all these infections as soon as you have a patient under your control that way you can see the patient regularly you have a culture sense with your hand and you feel a response is coming and that's the time in bacterial infection you should start steroid full dose and that will decrease the scarring in such cases and i think you know uh, appropriate management should be done early in these cases because sometimes we they don't see patient in the right time and that can create a problem and mostly is the bacterial infection in these cases and i rightly said some fungal ecanthema can occur and some young patient with the viral reactivation is one of the, one of the major challenge for all these patients as such thank you sir nice uh, case for you Yeah, very well presented, Pranav. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, as you said, devastating when you see the patient coming in like that. Uh, thanks, Dr. Namrata, for your valuable inputs. Uh, I think we'll move to the last. The present. last picture, yeah. So the last presenter. So, uh, I think so much that you are introducing, Dr. So uh, let me introduce Dr. Radhika Natarajan. she is the deputy director department of cornea and refractive surgery and head of the department of teaching and training at the shankar netral at chennai and she has 25 years of experience of being a clinician researcher a student mentor and she has to her credit several books which she has authored and co-authored her basic areas of interest are corneal infections and inflammation so over to you uh, dr radhika thank you for that kind introduction uh, hello all uh, i am radhika from uh, shankar netralia and uh, special thanks to dr somshila and the scientific committee for uh, having me here i'll share my screen right away can you see my slides Yes, can I slide the name audible? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, the last case and uh, my presentation for today uh, will be a case of uh, zero derma pigmentosa. So uh, zero derma pigmentosa we know is a rare autosomal recessive uh, disorder, but it is important for us cornea clinicians because many many XP patients have uh, corneal problems. and uh, basically uh, when ultraviolet light damages uh, uh, dna in the cells normal cells are able to repair that 
but due to an enzymatic defect, XP patients uh, are not able to execute that repair. And the nuclear material gets strewn about in the cells and that induces malignant changes in epithelial cells. Apart from widespread uh, cutaneous uh, involvement in the exposed parts of the body, the other important site of involvement seems to be the corneal limbus. And uh, the cause of this, these people get epithelial problems like FTKs, epi defects leading on to corneal ulcers. And the limbal instability also causes ocular surface tumors. All these were seen in my patient of xeroderma pigmentosa, who was also a single eyed patient. So basically, he was a 45 year old male patient. He was a known case of uh, xeroderma pigmentosa. He had multiple hyper and hypopigmented uh, macular papular lesions in his face and his arms. He had a couple of those big black lesions on his eyelids as well. And he was on photoprotective treatment when he uh, presented to us. One eye, he had lost a corneal infection long back. And in the second eye, he had undergone multiple procedures, which included a couple of keratoplasties and a cataract surgery, all of which were done elsewhere. He came to us with acute reduction in vision in his only seeing eye. And this is what we saw, that uh, there was a large and deep infiltrate in the corneal graft, limited to the graft area itself. Also noticeable uh, were two small areas, nasal bigger than temporal, uh, two areas of keratinized OSSN-like lesions. However, we did not know whether they were just dysplastic lesions or whether they were actually invasive carcinomas. Uh, we did a corneal scraping, which came positive for uh, aspergillus flavors. And uh, we started him on two topical antifungal agents in the form of natamycin and voriconazole eye drops, along with supportive medication. The culture also showed fungus. Unfortunately, he did not respond at all to the medical treatment, and we were forced to take him up for therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. We did a large TPK graft, and also we did an excision biopsy of the suspected OSSN uh, lesions. We gave a wide uh, excision margin, and uh, we adopted a non-touch technique to avoid uh, spilling of uh, uh, seeding over of cells inside the eye. And we also did a, a cryo application uh, freeze thaw technique to the edges. And uh, we continued the topicals postoperatively. The corneal button also grew fungus, and histopathology showed invasive squamous cell carcinoma with reasonably clear margins. Postoperatively, the uh, corneal graft, under very close watch and plenty of lubrication, uh, it did epithelize completely. You can uh, see that in this uh, picture over here. And uh, the uh, post-operative period did not show any recurrence of the fungal infection or recurrence of the small OSSN in the excised sites. However, um, three weeks later, when the patient came to us, as you can see in this uh, picture over here, he developed uh, uh, multiple whitish patches, leukoplakic-like lesions, especially on the eyelid, which you can see in this picture, and also in the nasal and temporal conjunctiva, which you can in the picture that I'm going to show you next. So we were wondering whether this was some kind of uh, recurrence of dysplasia that is happening in a site that is different from the previous excision. His systemic workup under the care of an oncologist came out normal. And the oculoplasty colleague wanted to actually take biopsy from the lid to look for evidence of malignancy. Then we figured out that the patient was on voriconazole eye drops and voriconazole drops as well as systemic voriconazole are prone to cause dysplastic changes. So we went easy on the drop, we stopped it and continued natamycin alone. And you can see in the picture below that the uh, whitish patches and the leukoplakic changes on the lower lid have disappeared completely. So the points to ponder in this case were, uh, xeroderma pigmentosa it is better not to do a keratoplasty, but if it had to be done with the primary surgeon who did the PK, would they have been better off doing a limbal support procedure along with the transplant? We had an in-house debate and we thought no, because uh, these limbal transplants have to be allogenic and they would require immunosuppression. And in a disorder which is already so prone to malignancy, it would not be a good idea to give prolonged uh, immunosuppression. And it's really not all or none. We saw that the therapeutic graft did epithelize over a period of time. So we could do the PK, wait and see if there is a hint of persistent epithelial problem we could jump in and do an alloslet or something. We have Dr. Sangwan's paper on it, which I have uh, referred later. 
And the treatment of the OSSN itself, when you have a corneal ulcer needing a TPK, do you want to give topical chemotherapy? Because in the presence of an ulcer, also these are very toxic medication. Already this epithelium is an unstable epithelium. So you don't want to use these drugs. But at the same time, doing a surface excision along with an intraocular procedure also carries the risk of seeding, which still now has not happened in our patient, but we are keeping our fingers crossed. And lastly, vodiconazole also leads to dysplasia, topically and systemically. It is a photosensitizing effect which leads to dysplasia, which is very much same as the photosensitizing dysplasia caused by the XP as a disease itself. So probably this drop should not be used in this disorder at all. However, our patient also showed and reports also show that boriconazole induced dysplasia does stop with cessation of the medication itself. So in XP, limbal support or not with PK, OSSN surgery and TPK surgery together or not, and boriconazole or not. So the expert panel, please uh, share your opinion on these. Uh, can I come in, Somashila? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, excellent, uh, Dr. Radhika, very well uh, uh, managed. It's a very <laughs> difficult case in a one-eyed uh, patient. One of the biggest learnings from this is something that I myself didn't know till, I, uh, till you sent me this and I did uh, read up on this, of the effect of voriconazole on causing these heaped up uh, uh, lesions on the lid. And otherwise, uh, I would have sworn that this is uh, requiring a lid uh, biopsy. Uh, and would never have suspected it uh, to be due to voriconazole. So that is a big learning for me, and I'm sure it's for the audience as well. And your take-home point is that voriconazole does have this uh, side effect. Uh, your, um, uh, I would have, I would agree with you that there were risks of doing an OSSN procedure along with the uh, uh, TPK. On first thought, I would have just done a TPK, and the OSSN is not really vision threatening, or or you could have waited for a month or two months and then done the OSSN. But as you did it with a no-touch technique with a triple free stop, the chances of seeding are, are not very great uh, in this. So I think what you did, it, it's, it's a one-eyed patient, you don't want to keep on doing surgeries. Right. So, uh, so what you did is, uh, is correct. With a no-touch triple free stop technique, you did uh, come to the conclusion you could get a histopath uh, and know what you're uh, dealing with. So I think there's a lot of learning learning points from your, you asked some questions, but more than that, you've given us a lot of answers on how to manage uh, difficult conditions like this. I have done two patients of um, XP with a Boston K-Pro, but that's uh, without any infections, just with uh, 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 failed grafts uh, in these patients because the grafts don't do so well optical. So instead of doing another optical graft, I've done a Boston K-Pro that seems to have done well now about almost nine years uh, follow up. But that's that's different. But for a patient with infection, which is one eye, I think excellently managed compliments. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. I would also like to ask Dr. Sangwan about his opinion on uh, alloslet as a primary procedure along with the first uh, PK. I mean, would immunosuppression be a good choice in you know this kind of a patient who's already prone for malignancies? So Dr. Dr. Sangwan uh, had to leave, so he's okay. not here. And the question on alloslet, I don't know, Feroz, if you had a chance to listen in. Uh, so this is a case of OSN. If, have you done any alloslet for these patients? Because yes. this was an OSN at the Nimbus and a large PK was done. So Yes, so yes, I do have experience with alloslet. Uh, uh, if it is a large tumor which is occupying more than 180 degree of the limbus, in fact, you know, uh, we really don't want the limbal stem deficiency happening. So yes, uh, I have just done two so far, not too frequently done because now that we have topical chemotherapy, so we try to reduce the size of the tumor, you know, chemo reduce or immuno reduce mm -hmm. the size of the tumor and then go for a limited excision. That's what we do now. Excellent case and uh, you have managed it so well, ma'am. Uh, so yes, uh, very learning, uh, quite a learning thank case. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Muskati as well. And thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to add to the discussion for this case? So, Dr. Somashila, can we come to the end of it? Yes, uh, I think it's been a long journey. Uh, although we couldn't stick to time, and apologies for that. 
but i'm very very happy with uh, the way this whole meeting went and we had some excellent presentations both by our uh, international faculty who were very kind to give their time which is early morning for them and spoke on two excellent topics covered it very well and uh, also i am so grateful to all our presenters who took out the best from their cases most difficult maybe very difficult to manage not everybody likes to show that they couldn't manage or the patient had this particular outcome it was very brave of them to present those cases and to discuss with us and teach us about the difficult management points in those cases i'm grateful to them and um, also grateful to dr partha biswas grateful to, to dr namrata sharma dr maipal sachdev who have helped us uh, put this together for the scientific committee and all of you know this is our first webinar and all my buddies on the scientific committee who have been with me paritosh who's my co moderator actually so he deserves all the uh, thanks and support from me because he has just been supporting doing everything in the background so uh, if i have forgotten anyone paritosh please chip in parikshit parikshit <laughs> the machine has been so busy in managing the activating everybody <laughs> <laughs> so she is the one who needs a drink actually at least a lemon juice please take my permission so, that i'm going no, to talk to somshila you just everybody you vanished on us uh, sorry uh, i don't we don't have i don't have any electricity right now okay and uh, thanks of course to all the attendees who who really sat through i actually messaged them earlier because i knew they might leave thanks yep. to the uh, tech support with cyan his team and the yes. rest and of course very the, good well helped a lot in in everything by managing all the different social media for us and thanks to dr partha for putting us all to work and getting us all chipped in and do it thanks a lot sir <laughs> thank you very much uh, sir kurish sir any last comments from you sir <laughs> no no as i i i always enjoy a good cornea session so i really enjoyed this one lot of lot of learning for us as well as not it's not only teaching it's learning for every single person who was there on either side of the fence agreed so thank you partha Wonderful for case. organizing an excellent cornea meeting thank you thank you sir thank you sir so thanks to the uh, thank you panelists all. and presenters fantastic presentations uh, mind boggling we have had very very good comments and uh, very appreciative comments from our viewers and also from the faculty thank you very much and thank you the scientific committee team uh, it's really a wonderful way of doing things and even so late at night all of us are there with you thank you thank you 8 so pm much. thank you thank you bye 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 thank you thank you dr somshila and aio scientific committee so yeah, are we are we all here now keep doing this